Well, wel welcome back, everyone. Uh, let, let's go ahead and get started. As mentioned earlier, we added a project on firm and engagement performance metrics to our research agenda. And uh, Skylar Sims from the Office of the Chief Auditor is going to help guide our discussion today, along with introducing our other panelists. So, Sky, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Barb. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome you to our session on firm and engagement performance metrics. As Barb mentioned, in response to comments made by both the IAG and the SEIAG at the June meeting, we have since added this topic to the research agenda, and we thought it would be a good idea to have more detailed discussion with this group. We view this as the start of a conversation, and in order to help start that conversation, we provided to you several materials in advance of this meeting, including the first is a briefing paper, which describes some background information, outlines key areas related to the topic, and includes discussion questions for the SEIAG members. I'm going to use CAG from now on. There are four points that I really just want to highlight and reiterate from that paper. Um, the first is that the idea of audit quality indicators goes back to the 2008 report that was issued by the U.S. Department of Treasury's Advisory Committee on the Auditing Profession, also known as ACAP. Among others, the report included a recommendation for the PCAOB to determine the feasibility of developing key indicators of audit quality. Over the years, both the PCAOB and our advisory groups have discussed the topic on a number of occasions. The second point I want to highlight is that in 2015, the PCAOB issued a concept release on audit quality indicators that described 28 potential indicators to which we received 50 comment letters. The third point I'd like to highlight is that over the years, while the PCAOB has not issued a rule or standard that requires disclosures of any specific metrics by firms, the PCAOB has required that certain information be provided by the firms through the auditor's report, for example, tenure, CAMS, and to the PCAOB via Form AP, lead engagement partner and other participants, for example. And that information is publicly available on our website. The fourth and final point I want to highlight is that firms over time have begun disclosing certain firm level metrics publicly through their audit quality reports or their transparency reports. The second item in your materials we also provided to you was a document called Attachment A, which reflects the recommendations from the 2013 Working Group of the IAG on Audit Quality Indicators. The recommendations were subsequently endorsed by the 2017 Working Group, and they relate to certain data compiled at both the engagement level and the firm level that firms would provide to the PCAOB. In that table, the staff indicated where some of this information may be available publicly already. The third item you received in your materials is attachment B. It's a report issued by Accountancy Europe earlier this year, which summarized AQI initiatives by other organizations, including regulators, oversight bodies, and others. We're going to structure our discussion today, beginning with dual members of the CAG and IAG, who will provide a brief overview of the discussions at the recent IAG meeting last month on October 12th. Then Jonathan Fuhardy, JD, from the Office of Economic Research and Analysis era, will provide some points to prompt for discussion on the economic considerations related to firm and engagement performance metrics reporting. And then lastly, Jessica Watts is going to tee up the questions for the CAG members and moderate our discussion today. With that, I'd like to turn it over to the IAG and CAG dual members to provide you with a brief overview of the discussions at the recent IAG meeting on October 12th. Ryan, you can take the slide down. So our dual members are um, Lynn Turner, Jennifer Joe, Sandy Peters, and Jeff Mahoney. So um, I'm not sure which would like to go first.
Okay. <laughs> In the, in the meantime, I could call on Lynn Turner, but I don't see him. No, Jessica, maybe maybe if we're we're waiting, please call on me when I join. But <clears throat> I'm happy to go through some of the notes I took <clears throat> at the I. Sure. So I I would say, and and maybe as I expect to hear today, we heard a variety of views and ideas. Uh, there was a discussion of firm metrics, uh, while some were looking for more. Others suggested that the focus be more so on engagement level metrics. Uh, there was discussion of information the PCOB already makes available through Form AP. Uh, there was some discussion to us giving consideration uh, on how, how to make it easier to access information we have on our website. Uh, we heard a few comments about specific information we could require, such as partner industry expertise, other partners assigned to the engagement, uh, discussion of what inspections can make, make available uh, through their reports or otherwise. Um, and I'll pause because I see Lynn, Lynn has joined, so. Keep going. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. That you can chime in if you think I missed something. Uh, there was also discussion uh, of certain challenges and, and how some data or metrics can be misleading. Um, and I, I think that's, that's um, you know, the summary I had. So certainly interested in whether Lynn, Sandy, uh, Jeff or Jennifer want to chime anything in at this point. So. I think um, one of the big issues that came across in the IAG discussion, especially for people who were carryovers from the former group, was that, you know, they wanted to see action post haste. And in particular, the data that's being presented in firm inspections, that it be presented in a searchable manner, that the PDF format, um, as you mentioned, um, the PDF format was most frustrating. But I think um, if, based on the history that Skylar presented, we know that the members who exist now and, you know, others from the investment community have been calling for disclosures. And so a lot of our discussion was centered on the fact that, you know, there was a call for more audit quality indicator disclosures and um, less action but very pleased to see that the board has actually put it on the agenda. Lynn? There, <clears throat> there was discussion about the project being put not on the agenda, but on the research agenda. And there was questioning of the board as to why it was on the research agenda, given it had been studied on nauseam in the past, been two presentations in the past by the IAG, uh, as we discussed earlier today. Also, the Office of Economic Analysis had spent a couple years working on it. And so there was questioning as to why it was still hung up on the research agenda rather than being on the standards agenda. And as I recall, Erica, Chair Williams, made the comment that the agenda is a fluid and changing agenda and she made a statement, some to the fact, as I recall, that she uh, expects to see the project move to the standard setting uh, 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 agenda <clears throat> in a reasonable period of time. If I mischaracterize her, her statements, you can ju jump in there. Barb, you, got it, I think. you got exactly right, Lynn, that um, 
our research agenda is different from research agendas in the past and no project would stay on there more than 12 months, but we anticipate moving this project in particular forward quickly and um, putting it on the standard setting agenda in 2023. So exactly right. Thanks, Erica. Sandy. Sure. I think um, I think all of that is right. There was also a discussion with respect to um, the availability of information for investors to make decisions with respect to um, their voting decisions. Um, you know, and I, I, there was um, sort of a discussion of the level setting of what is available to make investment decisions um, about the auditor um, or the voting decisions, I should say, and you know what's enough, what's um, what's too much, right? And I believe that, um, you know, as I walked away from the conversation, there were differing perspectives <laughs> on that um, issue. But as I walked away from the conversation and thought about it a bit more, you know, the reality of it is, is that as an investor who's voting someone else's shares, um, what you have to make an investment decision is the audit opinion, which describes the procedures that were performed, but not necessarily the results. You have an audit committee discussion and you have the naming of the audit partner and the number of years of the tenure, which is on the opinion. But you, but that's about all you have, right? And so for me, as I reflected on the conversation afterwards and this back and forth, um, it really, I really thought about the fact that you don't have a lot of information to, to cast your vote um, and really isn't the objective of this um, um, making an informed decision about casting your vote. And I think, you know, as I read the paper that was prepared for today, and, and maybe we'll talk about that a little bit, a little bit more as we go along, um, there was, if, if memory serves me, correctly, there was a discussion of the, the the changing of the name from audit quality indicators to performance measures, right? And some people have a view that they don't like that. Um, I personally am of the view that I do like that because I don't think that it, it eliminates a hurdle to needing information to make a decision to actually do your vote, whether we all can come to an agreement that every one of these perfectly defines audit quality or not. So there was some, I'm adding a little bit to what the conversation was, but that was topics were touched on and we'll touch off. I think we'll, in reading the um, memo for today, we'll touch on that a little bit more, but the topic of what's available, not everyone had a uniform sort of understanding and appreciation of what is available. And I would just reflecting on it again, reiterate, you have to check a box and what do you, about whether you retain the auditor and you vote for or against, and what do you have to make that decision when you have a fiduciary duty to vote someone's shares? Thank you, Sandy. Um, Sky? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jennifer, uh, Lynn, and Sandy for those remarks. Um, I'd like to turn it over now to Jonathan uh, Fulardi, JD from our Office of Economic Risk and Analysis. Uh, certainly, and, and thank you all for being here today. Um, as has been said, I'm Jonathan Fulardi, JD, uh, and I'm a member of uh, one of the teams that is working on firm and engagement performance metrics uh, in OERA. Uh, you've just heard a little discussion of what occurred in the recent IAG meeting, and in my brief comments today, I'm going to focus on the economic implications of firm and engagement metrics, FEPMs, formerly known as AQIs, and their disclosures. I will discuss some of the conceivable benefits and costs purely for the purpose of sparking debate. More directly, my comments here are solely intended to prompt various aspects of potential discussion as they may occur, and I don't intend to imply any conclusion about the existence or non-existence of benefits, costs, or unintended consequences, or any particular weighting thereof. Finally, as always, my comments are entirely my own. They do not reflect the opinions of the board as a whole, any individual board member, or any of the PCOB staff. So with that, at first I would like to point out 
that audit quality is itself fairly difficult to measure. Uh, it is, as a result, difficult to validate the relationships that are proposed uh, as a measure towards audit quality, and it's very challenging to perform this work. To put it simply, we could require the disclosure of some particular metric about a firm or engagement. Let's call it X for the sake of this discussion, just to give some color. How does X relate to audit quality? Does X plus one or an increase in X bring more quality? Does X minus one bring less? Is that relationship linear? Does two times X bring twice the quality? Does four times bring four times the quality? Or does that relationship taper off? What does that curve look like? Does the relationship of X to audit quality depend on some other variable Y? Maybe this is firm size or the number of climates, the type of climates, staffing ratio, what have you, or multiple other variables. What are these and are they able to be disclosed with X? Does X cause the changes in audit quality that we might document or are they only correlated? If the latter, does that correlation break down under certain conditions? Could it break down if historical trends in X were to change such as due to manipulation? Perhaps we don't really need to know the precise answers to these questions in order for requiring disclosure to have value, but it would be good to have a strong understanding of what requiring disclosure of X would mean. And then I'm going to just cover some major benefits, uh, conceivable major benefits and cost or unintended consequences. So firstly, FEPMs may provide investors with information which could improve the decision-making in governance issues such as the ratification of the auditor. Furthermore, they may provide investors with increased information which they can better use to understand the underlying risks of the issuers, reducing information asymmetry between investors, managers, and their auditors. Disclosure of the firm and engagement performance metrics may have benefits for audit committees in improving auditor selection, as you've no doubt heard. Audit committees use these metrics to compare and contrast characteristics of various auditors, allowing them to make informed decisions in selecting high quality auditors, in turn, increasing audit quality. Public disclosure of FE and PMs could also allow auditors to improve their own services by comparing their metrics with the works of other auditors, thereby again, potentially increasing audit quality. And then I wanna cover some potential costs or unintended consequences. Requiring disclosure of FEPMs could send the wrong signal or create perverse incentives that firms should focus predominantly on those metrics disclosed. This focus could lead to positive work, which improves audit quality, as previously discussed. However, also raises the specter of actions which might reduce audit quality. Firms could conceivably work to manage the figures, or they may simply focus too much on those metrics at the expense of other, perhaps unquantifiable aspects of audit quality. Requiring disclosure could have impacts on smaller auditors, such as costs associated with collecting and reporting the metrics. In the past, exceptions have been discussed to requiring the disclosures for those auditors to alleviate this concern. However, in the same light, it's conceivable that larger firms will be able to produce, using their greater resources, better metrics, and that may in turn may lead to increased concentration in the audit market. And finally, it remains to be determined whether there would be any impacts uh, on inspections and enforcement related matters. Lastly, as I mentioned at the very beginning, it's still unclear as to whether many of these proposed metrics strictly relate to audit quality. This point is important to consider as disclosure could bring in those cases limited benefits while possibly creating costs or unintended consequences. So with that said, I'm now going to turn it over back to you, Jessica and Sky, and the greater SEAG for your open discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. So in addition to the really great questions that Jonathan has just provided to us, um, in the materials that we provided, we also had some additional questions. So I just wanna um, provide those uh, to kick off the discussion because I want us to think about what Jonathan said and then also the, the questions that we had provided previously. Brian, could you pull up those questions real quick? Yep, they'll be up in just a moment. Thank you. So while he's pulling those up, oh, thank you. So here there were a group of seven questions that we provided so in thinking about the materials we were wondering um 
how are you or investors currently using the information that is publicly available either from the PCOB, as Sky mentioned on um, Form AP, or through the, the firms. So they have, as Sky mentioned, their transparency reports and some of their audit quality reports. Um, what are your views related to the comparability across firms of these performance metrics? Three, besides the metrics already published by the PCOB and provided by the firms, what other performance metrics would be useful to investors and audit committees and others? Um, how do or will users use firm level or engagement level performance metrics in their decision making? How would you expect this information to be reported, either through Form AP, the firm's audit quality reports, transparency reports, published on the firm's um, websites, in the um, auditor's report, other, or other methods? Which firms should be required to provide this information? So is it all firms that are um, registered with the PCOB and on all engagements? or firms that um, only audit over a hundred issuers, so those that are currently annually inspected, or maybe firms that audit a specific number of issuers or broker dealers. And then um, are there unintended consequences to requiring firm reporting on of performance metrics? And I think that's a lot of what Jonathan was also covering. So that's kind of our list of questions in addition to what Jonathan um, mentioned that we wanted to kick off this discussion. And I already see we have a hand up, Dane. Sure. Um, I guess, you know, as an investor, I guess I'll, I'll give some thoughts on what we're doing and what we could do with these additional data points. So um, internally, we already do have an audit quality scoring uh, framework that we use, and we're ingesting data on all um, U.S. You know, public companies. We use a data provider. We're ingesting that data, and we are looking them uh, on different dimensions. Um, as, as Sandy alluded to, the data that's available isn't great. A lot of the things that we have to look at currently are kind of historical incidences of, you know, restatements, internal control weaknesses, um, uh, other types of issues that might indicate that perhaps the, the, the audit is of potentially lower quality. My um, dream case, I guess, would ultimately be that there'd be uh, a lot of improvement to the form AP, and we'd see uh, AQIs coming through the form um, AP at an engagement level. So, and also the, the form a AP would move from PDF form to a database form. Um, I put a little comment in the, the section there. You could kind of think of it a lot like the um, Form 5500 data, which is available on the Department of Labor website, where it's all structured data. There's, you know, form questions that they're supposed to ask, so data will go into fixed places, so things can come in in a spreadsheet. People can go to the website, site, self-serve, pull down the web, um, the spreadsheet, get all those analytics for every single engagement, um, and then also have an API available. Uh, because uh, more and more in the investment community, we're, we're building tools that are ingesting data. So we would ingest this data across the universe. And in terms of how we would do, use it at the engagement level, um, we'd look at all these indicators, and different indicators would be have different relevance for different types of issues. Like if if I'm focused on you know derivative risk, I'm going to want to see how many experts are involved in, in the audit, how 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 much is there, or um, you know, if, if the audit partner is spending 5% of their time on uh, this particular audit, <laughs> that would raise questions as to, you know, how much of their attention is really occupied it if they have, say, you know, six or eight other um, audit clients. So how this would start is we would look at all these uh, AQIs. We would do a lot of, you know, a lot of like what the academic community would do. Um, we would look at cases of previous audit failures. Um, and then we try to make correlations. You know, if we had seen some of these data points, might these have given us indicators? And then over time, as the data is available, we'll be able to, to kind of back test and get a sense for, for what's, what's effective or not. And as we focus on the outliers, how it will lead to engagement, we are fundamental investors. So we would make, have calls with management teams. We would have calls with the chair of the audit committee. And we want to talk about it because ultimately the investors are paying for the audit. You know, the, the cost issue isn't an issue. We pay for the audit. And so we, as the owners of the company, 
And so ultimately, the AQIs are our best ability to get a sense for whether we're buying a good product or not. And so we can then ask questions and uh, kind of investigate further whether we're getting uh, value for our money and whether the audit's a good audit. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Dane. That was very helpful. Uh, Sandy Peters. My comment actually fits pretty well with what Dane had said. You know, as I read this um, this document, uh, the the memo, one thing that really stuck out with me is on page five. There's a statement, and it and it, it copies a, a study which I I didn't have a chance to read in detail, but it says that audit quality is itself immeasurable and to me that's a um a really a, um concerning statement right and even in some of the things that um dane said we're using failure as a measure of quality right and failure is the ultimate measure of lack of of, of quality right it is not an indicator of quality it is a failure right and so I think it get back, gets back to the earlier point of what information do we actually have to evaluate quality? So when, um, is, it, uh, is it Justin or Jonathan? Sorry, I should remember that. My brother's name is Jonathan. You were saying, is it X plus one or X minus one or X times Y? What's X in measuring audit quality, right? Is I think really the, the, the question um, at hand for investors. And what, Zane, uh, what Dane is actually describing is at a SEC Investor Advisory Committee meeting a year or so ago, maybe, I don't remember exactly which one it was, um, Colleen Honigsberg from Stanford referred to the fact that audit is a credence good, right? And, and this study basically is saying, we can't measure it because we don't have the information. So that makes it immeasurable rather than saying, if we had information, we would be able to measure it. Because I read that and I also say, well, then how does how does the PCAOB measure quality, right? They obviously have more information, which I think gets to the central issue of what information do we actually have to as investors to evaluate audit quality, right? In the as I said from the outset, it is the audit report, which is procedures, it's the audit committee um, um, document. That's and and it's a couple pieces of information on form AP which aren't necessarily indicative quality. They're just indicators of who does the work, right? Um, and I my experience has been that investors don't read the firm level um, uh, reports. Um, a lot of them don't know they necessarily exist, right? And a lot of them are very qualitative. Some have, are quantitative. I I will give them that. But one of my questions in looking at the summary in, in the um, paper is, has anybody mapped out the quantitative ones and looked at them across firms and by indicators? I, I have not done that, maybe others have. But I think that gets to the question of, um, I mean, to me, this should be measurable, right? We're creating a set of work papers. The work papers are, are the evidence of, in fact, audit quality. And I think for investors, the challenge is, why can't we do this? Why can't we get more, right? And Dane, I think, ap ap described well how they might use it. But I think the question is, we need, some, we need something to be able to move it, the audit out of the range of a credence good, even if it's not perfect, to then be able to make a question about how to make it more measurable is I think the issue that, um, investors have face, are facing, and I think what came up at the IAG about um, why is this on the research agenda and not on the standard setting agenda, because as the paper indicates, you know, this has been on the agenda in some form for almost 10 years. So anyway, just an add on to what Dane was saying and linking it to the previous conversation or the previous comments I made. Uh, Robert Nickel. I'm not sure I was next, but thank you because uh, I really want to respond to Sandy's comment. I know. Uh, 
And by the way, thank you. Uh, as the author of the original Credence Goods paper in auditing, papers in auditing, uh, it's nice <laughs> to hear somebody actually mention that. Um, and and this it's this is a fundamental issue. I'm fairly agnostic about AQIs. I mean, we can certainly do this, and there's information to be gained out there. But there is this fundamental problem: is we cannot operationally define what audit quality is. And if you can't operationally define something, it's really hard to figure out how to measure it. And so in the end, I mean, I've got a lot of points that may come up later, so I'm just going to cut it short here. But in the end, what we measure, and this is Jonathan's comment, we measure a lot of things that we kind of hope are correlated with the unobservable quality that we're all interested in. But we really don't know if it is. And furthermore, we don't know what the functional form of that relationship is. I mean, is, uh, you know, just taking one kind of metric people often mention is how much time did the partner spend on the engagement? Uh, you know, what is the right number? Nobody knows the right number. And that is highly idiosyncratic potentially to any individual engagement. So these are, I mean, there's some really significant issues. And then when you look at this within the context of the manage management accounting literature, which has studied a lot of these types of internal use of quality control uh, systems, you often find that the results are very dysfunctional. So in the bottom line is this is not necessarily a bad idea. It's not something we, I think it's something that makes a lot of sense to try to do. But I don't think we should underestimate the problems if, that that we will confront, and this, which is why there's not been a lot of action on this issue. In the, you know, I've been around a long time. There's not been a lot of action, and uh, I saw Preeti mentions the uh, transparency reports. Well, in Europe, they've been around a long time, and pretty much research shows that they don't matter. They just don't really tell anybody anything that they need to know, uh, at least that we can observe. So, I mean, I think this is a great dialogue, and I look forward to the rest of the conversations. I'm going to shut up now. <laughs> Pretty. since you were mentioned, I'm going to pass it on to you. Oh, you're muted. Okay. Am I okay now? Yes. Um, so a couple thoughts. I agree with Dane that making the data available at the engagement level is going to be most useful. Um, I also agree with Robert and because of Robert's comments, I think it's we should need to be careful not to call them AQIs. Um, I definitely support disclosing the metrics, but because it's very hard to know for sure what the exact relationship is, by making the data available, what Dane's process that he's describing is that we learn from the data and we figure out how to use the data and we figure out what the nuances are, are that certain firms we're going to expect certain things and other ones we may not expect, you know, in a different engagement, you know, the same kind of thing. And that's a learning process that we can only engage in if we have the data to begin with. So I think the data needs to be in a searchable database. It needs to be disclosed at the engagement level, um, and it needs to not be called AQIs, maybe engagement metrics or something like that. Uh, but the uh, current, you know, landscape of the transparency reports, I've looked at a number of them over time. Every year, what a firm talks about changes, the wording they use changes, the definitions change. Uh, so in order to make this useful, we need to have clear definitions of what how to define the engagement metrics so that they are comparable across firms. And then we need some sort of inspection process to ensure that firms are faithfully reporting it. Um, and without that, any metric is going to be virtually useless because it's not going to be comparable. And that's what we have right now is firms, uh, audit firms, you know, disclosing whatever they want and having it change from year to year and uh, from firm to firm. And then my last thing that I wanted to say is, um, the Portuguese, li I looked at all the lists. I think the ones, the Portuguese list was actually the best. It was simple and clear. Many of the items mentioned there, there is research to support that those are correlated at least with audit quality. Um, and specifically having more disclosures about middle managers in the audit, that is senior managers and managers. There's been some research um, that I did with the PCOB and other research outside of the PCOB's 4A that supports that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Preeti. That's good insights. Um, Brian Croto. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, I welcome this discussion. I think it's a, a great discussion on a topic that really matters relative to understanding audit quality and understanding um, how firms operate and, and what they focus on relative to audit quality. 
Um, I do think this is an area that has evolved over the years. We're very proud of our audit quality report. And I, and I would I would comment because not everyone probably appreciates there is a difference between an audit quality report and a transparency report. And most of the larger firms are producing both. The transparency reports tend to be um, a, a shorter version that's compliance focused relative to EU requirements. The fuller version of an audit quality report contains a lot more information in what we call our transparency data points that are quantitative. So that gets into areas on human capital like turnover, utilization, uh, how we how we leverage offshore resources, the use of specialists, experience levels, training, independence, output measures like inspections and restatements. And we're, we've tried to be very comprehensive. The list of our transparency data points, and I take the point on not calling them AQIs, which we purposely don't do either. I think that makes good sense. We call them transparency data points. We've over the years added to that list each year based on an evaluation of what we see others in the profession doing and then what we do internally relative to managing our own practice. So we don't have a, a separate list internally that we're not sharing. We, we share and we make transparent the same measures in, in data points that we're looking at internally. Um, I know that for us, and I think many of the other firms, when we do change from year to year, our footnotes disclose both the old measure and the new very transparently relative to why we're changing, what we changed, and what the measure would have looked like under the old computation. So we're not trying to hide the ball on that, but there are reasons as we evolve our business or as we try to be more comparable to what others are disclosing that we sometimes do make changes from year to year. Um, so what I would say, though, is we receive fairly positive feedback when we do get feedback relative to the disclosures that we make. That's not to say that we're not willing to learn or make more disclosures or new disclosures at the firm level relative to uh, our transparency data points. But I do think you'll find a fair amount of commonality among at least the annually inspected firms in the kinds of disclosures that you see. But, but the quantitative disclosure by itself is just the beginning. Really, then, that helps us write our audit quality report and describing how we think about those measures each year what we're doing when we've got, for instance, more turnover or higher utilization or a change in our delivery model. And, and so the story that we tell is the story that we've worked through during the year ourselves in managing quality and managing our business. So I, I do think that those reports have come a long way. I think if you haven't spent some time looking at, at them for the larger firms, um, annually inspected firms for sure, I, I think spending some time with them, looking how they compare to one another, enables you to ask very good questions of, of, of individual firms relative to how they're thinking about quality, how they're managing their practices. Um, at the engagement level, there's diversity as to what audit committees may be interested in, in, in seeing. Certainly, we provide extensive information to the extent that there, there's interest or, or based on request. Um, and, and that informs how we think about firm level disclosures as well, where there might be requests at the engagement level over time that's caused us to think about incremental firm level disclosure as well. So I guess I would just say that I think um, you know important as you're beginning to move forward, understanding what the discussion that, that led to where we are today have results in firms really making a lot of transparent disclosures. Um, and if some are looking at the transparency reports, you're probably not even seeing um, the full extent of those disclosures. So I'd encourage you to look for the um, audit quality reports for each of the firms. And and I suspect like our firm, uh, other firms would be very receptive if, if there were measures that aren't being reported today that someone thought would be useful, we certainly would consider making additional disclosure. Uh, that is what's caused us to get to where we are today. Uh, but again, we, we very much align to how we manage our, our, our own practice today. Thank you, Brian. Uh, John White. Uh, thank you. I, I feel like I want to respond to like everybody. And I <laughs> say I agree with everybody and I can't remember exactly what everybody said, but let, let me at least lay out the way I find myself looking at this as an advisor to audit committees frequently. Um, and I guess I'm what I'm really suggesting is is that a an additional way of looking at all this is to look through the lens of uh, of audit committee members. And I say that I fully appreciate, I guess Sandy said it at the beginning, but that what we're talking about here is at one level is information so investors can better cast their vote on whether to approve the auditors. And I certainly recognize that that is, I guess, perhaps the number one goal of this discussion. But 
I guess I find myself focusing on a different goal and one that I think is very important, and that is the planning for the individual audit that's going on. And that planning is obviously between the audit committee and the auditors. I mean, the auditors present an audit plan and then they, they engage with the audit committee uh, to figure out what, you know, what you're actually going to do. And what I, what I feel like I, we, what we need is these audit quality indicators to help the, or whatever the right title is, to help the audit committee work with the auditor each year in figuring out what's the plan for the audit. I mean, you have to remember the audit committee, they're, they're your number one line of defense. They're there every day in the, in the weeds with the auditors. Um, and I guess, Jonathan, what you were saying back at the beginning really struck me is the information that I think that audit committees need when they're looking at these indicators. And you, you were talking about whether they are correlated or just causal with respect to high quality audits. I guess I would, you know, does X produce a higher quality audit is what is one of the things that I think is would be very useful for an audit committee member to know when you know the the staffing ratio or the number of the number that's being done of amount of work that's being done at uh, a service center or the amount of work that's being done by specialists or the number of hours and all the different engagement level pieces of information the audit when that's presented to the audit committee they should be saying well on our audit aren't we this or that should we get more of this should we get more of that um and the PCOB inspection process, when you have your 900 inspections, you're, you, you see the results of audits across the board and across firms. Remember, it's, it's not just one firm, you see all the firms. If you could be giving audit committees, I mean, it, it, it would be public to everybody, but if you could be putting out the information that these particular quality indicators provide useful information or, or correlate or are causative of high quality audits, I think audit committee members would use those. Um, and they, I don't even have to, they, it's not having data about the firm, it's having data about specific indicators and how that would help the audit committee plan their particular audit to make it better. Um, and so I guess I, I I heard I hear Sandy and I agree entirely that number one is to help the investors cast their vote. But I think we should be thinking about some of this is how do we help audit committee members do their job every year, I, every day. I, I need to be clear. I, I'm I agree. I'm in raging agreement with that. I'm just using I'm I'm using that as an illustration of the ultimate outcome of what an investors the action they have to take to draw a better picture with respect to what investors have to make a decision today. And while certainly audit committees can do it, we want to hear more from everyone who's there to protect our interests. Auditors, investor, or I'm sorry, auditors, audit committees, um, and management, right? So my comment was simply, it, it is actually at the firm level because I'm talking about voting a, a particular, not, I'm sorry, at the issuer level, not the, Engage, not the audit firm level, because that's where we're taking a decision. Um, my point, I, I, I'm in agreement with you. So I, I just want to make sure my point is is uh, clearly understood. Thank you. Yeah. I, if you take my comment kind of to, to its its further conclusion, it it may, I'm sure a number of you won't necessarily agree with this, but you don't necessarily have to have as much disclosure to investors about everything, if you can just tell audit to me, I mean, which is going to be, I have to assume is going to be uh, a challenging issue with respect to the audit firms in terms of describe, if when you really take this to the engagement level and public disclosure, um, you, you don't really need, well, in, in what I'm trying to suggest as a goal is give the audit committee the tools that they can use 
uh, and knowing that if you have this or that, what correlates with a high quality audit so they can ask for that as they are planning the audit. And Sandy, I didn't, I, I wasn't being critical of you in the slightest. I, the, the casting your vote is the most important thing here. I'm not, I'm not. Oh, I didn't take it as a criticism. Okay. I didn't take it as a criticism. I just wanted to clarify my point. I, I agree. Um, I just don't think that the, the the audit committee, we do want it at the, um, the level, we do want the audit committee to be proactive. Certainly we want to know these things. We want them to do things in advance. We just don't want it to only be for the, um, to the audit committee. We want a not it to be a bad game of telephone, but a transparent game of or a transparent process where um, there can be a good dialogue with respect to the measures and whether or not they ultimately lead to that quality. Okay. All right. Well, I, it, it's this is a point I've made at other times. I think I think at our prior meeting, in fact, but I got to expand on it a little bit here. So thank you. Thanks, John and Sandy. Uh, Christine Devine. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, I do think that uh, these metrics can provide potential value to users and to the audit committee, as we've been talking about, uh, particularly in their oversight and their responsibility over audits. Some of the data that I've read on audit committee input, which I do agree with, is that there should be a flexible approach as you think about these metrics because one size doesn't necessarily fit all and that the metrics should be uh, considered based upon what the firms see as useful in driving their audit quality both at the firm level and the engagement level. Uh, another point I think is for these metrics, there needs to be appropriate context around them so that a user can understand them. It's you know more than one metric. It's qualitative and quantitative. I think of the SEC's non-GAAP measure framework as kind of a good thing to look at because it's all about not dictating what measures are used by an issuer for non-GAAP measures or key performance indicators. It's about what is most useful to that issuer, what's the purpose, what's the use, how is it computed, all the disclosure around the, the context for it. Another point in the questions was uh, what other metrics perhaps should be considered. And in that regard, I think it's important to connect this to how it's going to interplay with the quality control standard that we've been talking about today and how any of these metrics would fit into that communication about our quality control, which is, of course, the underpinning of how we achieve audit quality. And another point I wanted to make on one of the questions on comparability, I do think that's a a real issue to think about, um, and it's not just comparability among the firms, and there is certain differences, even among the big four, there's differences in your structure, there's difference in geography, there's difference in client portfolio, the, the risks, the industries, the type of clients. There's even differences within a firm based on, again, those same types of factors and even engagement level to uh, engagement level. So I think that's where the context of these measures will need to come into play. Thank you, that's helpful. Uh, Jeff Mahoney. Oh, thank, thank you very much. Just a, a couple points. I, I know John already covered this extensively as did Sandy, but uh, our members view uh, voting their proxies as an asset of the fund and so uh, right now they have limited data points they can use when they look at voting for the re-election of the audit committee chair, voting for the re-election of audit committee members, as well as the auditor ratification vote. So this, um, these metrics could give them a additional data point where they have very little information today. Uh, to help them with those those three votes, you know, right now, for example, say on pay is a vote that occurs annually at most companies. Our, our members have a lot of information. They, they would like more, but they have a lot of information in the proxy uh, to help them decide how to how to uh, uh, take that vote. But on but on the three items, audit committee chair members and the audit ratification vote, they have very little 
to go on, and this could be a helpful, helpful data point for them. Uh, with respect to Jonathan's questions, I think they're very good. I, I think uh, if I was Jonathan, uh, uh, some of the people I would talk to or some of the organizations I would talk to where I think I might be able to get answers to some of those questions is, is one, I would, I would talk to Greg Jonas, who, as you know, was at the PCOB for a number of years in charge of this issue. Many of the six years I spent on SAG, he was the person in charge. I think he could answer some of Jonathan's questions. Um, the other thing that's happened is uh, over the years, you know, we've been look, talking and debating this issue ever since the Treasury Committee report 14 years ago. But um, now we see, as your paper points out, a lot of other regulators outside the U.S. are now moving forward, uh, requiring some type of metrics along these lines. So if I was Jonathan on the PCOB staff, I, I would I would contact you know, Portugal, I'd contact uh, the FRC in the UK, I would contact uh, the Netherlands. Uh, FRC and Netherlands, they're gonna put this information out publicly. So those would be two that would be particularly important and ask them some of those questions. And I suspect uh, you will get uh, uh, some of those questions answered uh, from uh, some of the foreign audit regulators who have decided they're gonna go forward on this. So those are my, uh, uh, my comments, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Those are helpful suggestions. Um, Jim Hunt. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Jessica. I'm going to comment uh, and follow up on some of the things that John said, so I'll try to be brief, and I'm going to say them from the perspective of an audit committee chairman. And since I've been trained by the PCAOB, I'll say that these comments don't represent the companies I represent, but they are my own, in fact. But, but the the consideration of quality is very localized and in order to get to the macro of investor ultimate investor protection i think you have to begin with the micro and that is the individual from the individual uh issuer level audit keep in mind that in my view um audit quality is is assumed at the at the individual issuer level at the individual audit committee level you have an ongoing relationship with the audit firm and unless something goes bad, you do assume it to Sandy's point, you know, the negative being audit failure. So I, I think that's a, a first consideration. And so in order, again, in order to get from the from the micro, you, you do have to get to the macro. So putting more tools in the hands of audit committees for their consideration is very, very important in my view. The PCAOB inspection reports are terrific and they're used. But, they're, but the timeliness of them is such that, you know, on an ongoing basis, you'd rather have more contemporaneous information. I think the fact of the matter is, if an audit firm gets in trouble and it's noted trouble that's reported in the journal or elsewhere, the audit committee chairman will have a conversation with the CFO and the CEO and bring in the audit partner of the firm and kind of ask the question, okay, what, what happened and does it relate to us? And once you get the answer, no, you know, here's what happened, no, it can't relate to you. Then you kind of you kind of back away from that consideration a little bit, unless you think it's an ongoing cultural issue, with the firm, and then you move it further. With respect to the comparison among firms of audit quality indicators, again, at the issuer level, that's going to be important if you're considering changing firm. But an ongoing basis with an ongoing relationship with a firm, you do consider that you have, you know, I have good audit quality, unless I hear otherwise. I'll I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Diane Rubin. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I am also uh, responding from the perspective as an audit committee chair and um, agree with everything that Jim has just mentioned. Um, <clears throat> I will tell you that it's a challenge for audit committees to measure and evaluate audit quality. And the, your first question asks about public information that we use, and certainly the inspection reports are very valuable to us, and we use them to do a deeper dive with our auditor on their quality control procedures, including independence, training, internal inspections, and what those internal inspections uh, show pre issuance reviews, their monitoring procedures. We discuss the experience of their 
national office or their expert panels um, to make sure that there's sufficient depth of in experience in our industry. And um, we talk about turnover. It is at the engagement level um, rather than the firm level um, because the, the turnover across their many offices is not as germane to us as what's the turnover locally at our engagement. Um, we've never discussed how many hours or other engagements the partner has or the partner's work-life balance. Um, and we do communicate with the auditor on a year-round basis. So we have regular communication and, um, and, and we are fully aware of how, how much time he's, he or she is spending on the engagement. Um, with regard to comparability of the factors of these uh, performance me metrics, um, I believe it is a, a challenge. Um, on the firm level metrics that you identified, certainly training has a correlation to competence. Um, but you don't really know what the training is in. Is it in technical? Is it in ethics? Um, I do have comfort. I am from California, so I know that um, in California, the State Board of Accountancy mandates, as I'm sure in all of your states where you are, they mandate a minimum number of continuing professional education hours, including a certain percentage significant percentage in technical. California mandates eight hours of fraud education every cycle. It mandates ethics education. So I have a certain comfort level on training. Um, and if, if an additional metric was given of overall firm training, it goes back to Jonathan's point is if it's 10 hours more than the minimum, is that 10 times better or if it's 20 hours more than the minimum, is that 20 times? So it's it's hard to be comparable. Um, the other one is turnover. I think you can have um, <clears throat> some comparability of turnover within a region, but it's harder the more geographic you make it. And, um, and it's a point in time and you really need context in order to see whether that turnover issue is um, a significant one year to year or if it's a, a matter of time. Um, the other metrics for me, I think um, the size of the firm, as was mentioned before, could be an issue. Some of the metrics mentioned a dollar amount invested in a learning center or the number of professionals who maintain independence policies. And this will certainly um, vary by firm size. Um, firm policies may enter into it. There was one metric that talked about the average years of experience by partner. And some firms have a mandatory retirement age. Sometimes it's 58, sometimes 62, 65, and some firms don't have a mandatory age. So, um, so that will make comparability um, more difficult. And then um, on the unintended consequences, um, portion of, of, of the questions. I think um, a lot of thought has to be given to why you're asking for a particular metric and to realize that mandated metrics will drive behavior. And I did notice that one of the <clears throat> one of the factors, one of the AQIs listed by one of the countries in the paper um, had client satisfaction as an AQI, and that may or may not drive quality because if you are, if you are rewarded for having a higher client satisfaction rating, that may lead you to demonstrate less professional skepticism, have a less, be nicer, be a friendlier auditor, and that would not necessarily drive the kind of behavior that you want. So, um, it reminds me of a of a quote sometimes attributed to Einstein that not everything that counts can be counted and not everything that can be counted counts. So I would just um, suggest that we we really take a look at which which um, 
metrics are the critical ones and to make sure we we understand why we're why we're asking for them thank you <laughs> thank you diane that was very insightful um sarah lord Thank you. I think this is, is great discussion and agree with the concept of some of the engagement driven metrics being more actionable by the audit committee and by investors. One of the things I want to bring back to that Jonathan talked about in his very opening remarks, though, is scalability and concentration. So everything that we talk about every time you institute anything new, it costs, it costs money and effort and diligence. And so. Now, there's been comments in the chat too about, okay, this needs to not only be reported, it needs to be consistent, it needs to be inspected. All of those things are great and they add value and cost. And they both go together, right? And there's a trade off there. Some of the recent, you know, there were comments that about you know, 900 or so firms inspected. One of the audit analytics reports recently, like 600 of those audit one issuer or one PCOB registered company. So, what is the cost to that firm to be able to comply with this? And are the investors of that company actually using this information? And I think that's something that as this moves forward, it would be really good to do an economic analysis around for the largest companies. Yes, investors are very interested and are doing proxy voting. What about all of the companies under the PCOB's jurisdiction? Are smaller reporting companies acting in the same manner? Do they have the same need for this information? Is it useful to them? Is it gonna be used? It's useful, it's useful information, but will it actually be used? Will it actually be used by broker dealer um, owners, people choosing those engagements? And so I think it could be something that maybe there's a phase implementation, but just more work to make sure we're not creating an environment where hundreds of firms say, you know what, this is what pushed me over the edge. Now, this is another cost that I really don't see anyone actually using the information of, and thus I don't want to do this work anymore because I don't think that would have the right impact that we want on, on the capital markets and on the choice product firms. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Josh Jones. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Jessica. I mean, I think similar to prior comments, I think this is a really, you know, great discussion. I, and, you know, I, I think from EY's perspective, as maybe as Brian mentioned earlier, we've, we've tried really hard to, to provide more metrics in our reports over time. And, you know, I think to, to Jim and Diane's point, I, I think those end up, you know, promoting really robust discussions between audit committees and engagement teams on on their particular audit, the audit quality reports, the the metrics they provide at a firm level, combined with inspection reports, really can can add to a very robust discussion around how the audit, the particular audit, is designed and and how it's being executed, and really really makes for uh, I guess we have found really meaningful discussions that that help. I think the audit committee in their in their oversight. I, I guess the interesting thing about that is is that you know it, it gets into the importance of of context, and we've talked a lot about you know comparability. And I think what I think what I, I continue to hear is you, you really need to have that context in order to have any ability to drive comparisons, um, because every audit's a little different. The staffing of every audit's a little different. The leverage model might be a little different. It might be different across firms, within a firm, lots of different kind of variables. And uh, and being able to have that context is, is is really important. And so one of the, which is a, as kind of part of the reason this has been on the agenda for a while, is that's a really hard thing to do kind of kind of broadly. Um, and so one 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 thing that I, I guess it probably starts with is there a common kind of, I'll call it appreciation for how any measure could contribute to, to audit quality. And, and maybe that's, you know, I think Christine mentioned this earlier, maybe that's an area where if, if, if we're going to go down a path, you kind of maybe start with the, the PCOB's project on the system of quality control, where it's really articulating kind of those key elements of what a system is intended to have. And then, you know, use that as a, as really a platform to, to help kind of build, you know, any thoughts on measures that, that can impact audit quality or have, have influence on audit quality and then use that as a place to kind of build, build, build from there, just to help help drive. Perhaps you know everyone may have different value judgments in terms of what might drive um, or influence audit quality, but having maybe a, a a common kind of platform around how some of those are derived in the system, you know, might be a, a helpful place to to start the discussion. Yes, thank you, Josh. Bob Hearth. 
Great. Thank you, Jessica. You know, I too appreciate all the comments that everybody uh, has provided so far. Um, <clears throat> I was a former audit partner, so I've signed opinions and looked at our teams and all of those things. And I was on the SAG when Greg did his work. I, I thought the comment about tapping back into Greg Jonas's brain, um, you know, <laughs> would be a good idea. And I, I think certainly as we talked as uh, as Jim and Diane and others described their audit committee chair activities, and I thought about this ratification proposal that's in a proxy where management is rec recommending a certain choice. Uh, many other proposals have detail about how the management or others are thinking about it and why they're making the recommendation. And uh, those audit committee chairs gave, gave some good examples of the things they looked at. So you wonder if beyond the, the recommendation of the firm, and I know this is maybe outside of our jurisdiction. Maybe there could or should be some disclosures about the particular things the audit committee did to come to their conclusion and discussion with management, or what management did with the audit committee to, to come to the conclusion that that was the firm um, that they they recommended. And I think all the discussion has been good. Um, you know, it's kind of a trite saying: "Don't let perfection be the enemy of the good." So I mean, we're making some good progress. There's a lot of perfection that's been described here, but. Um, we won't become a world-class athlete by next Friday. <laughs> Thank you. No, we probably won't. <laughs> um, Jennifer Burns. Thanks, Jessica. Um, I wanted to mention two data points and maybe build on what Bob said. We've made a lot of progress in this space. You know, looking back over the last 10 years, um, the firms have made significant strides in what they're reporting. And earlier this year, um, the AICPA did do a survey. We got over a thousand respondents to that survey, gathering data about the AQIs that firms currently use today. I shared that information with Barb and uh, we'd be happy to talk through with you what we did and how we got that information. Um, so just let us know. Um, and then secondly, uh, the CAQ did come out with an audit quality disclosure framework and I do think many firms use that at least as a starting point. And so I do think that that helps provide consistency in practice. So going to that point about consistency. Thank you, Jennifer. And thanks for the suggestion of, or the offer to meet. Um, Brian Croto. Thanks. And I, I just wanted to pick up um, on, on what Josh and, 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 and others have said, Christine, certainly. Um, just on the engagement level uh, performance indicators or, or transparency data points. And I, I think as you think about those and, and, and certainly helpful for audit committees and comparing to the firm level uh, data points and asking questions relative to engagement of the specific engagement. But if you think about any individual data point like turnover, the real question then is if there is more turnover on the engagement than average at the firm level or, or in prior years or however you want to measure it, the real question is, what does the firm do about that? And how do they, um, you know, replace those who have turned over on the team? How do they structure the team in response? That's that's what really matters at that point when there is turnover, as we all know. And, and that just through disclosure of whether there has been incremental turnover or whether the turnover is above average on a particular team, you know, that that's the kind of information that would be most useful to the audit committee in understanding uh, in their oversight role, that's very difficult um, relative to public disclosure, relative to each and every engagement on the other hand. So I, I just think as you think about engagement level transparency data points, it's important to give consideration to how they would be used, the context in which one would need to understand that information, and then what the purpose of that information would, would, would be. And, and certainly audit committees are at the right level and in the right position to act upon that information um, you know, what, what one does with that as an investor, if there were sort of public disclosure about that without, you know, understanding the full context around it, I'm not, I'm not so sure. And, you know, requiring disclosure around the full context of that may be pretty onerous in terms of the level of detail one would need to get into it at the engagement level. So I, I just, you know, I, I just offer that for, for consideration and I'm glad, I'm glad Jen mentioned on um, the CAQ document, not only. I think do we and others use that document as at least a starting point for consideration, but but it's been updated as we all think about over time what we've disclosed um, so that we can you know continue to share among the profession some of the best practices relative to disclosure in our audit quality reports. So I uh, just want to add that. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. 
Robert Nickel. Thank you. I'm uh, just going to follow up with a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, I want to clarify, I'm not against this idea. Um, I just find it, there's a lot of interesting challenges from an academic point of view to making it work. Uh, and let me, uh, you know, on one hand, uh, what I'm hearing is a lot of discussion of the audit committee, and I think that's absolutely where this conversation should occur. And in theory, does the audit committee would have the, have the authority and power to be, have, have these conversations directly with their auditors if they wanted to do so. The one thing they would not probably be able to do is obtain comparable information across engagements, which is where some of the uh, potential challenges of comparability come in. Uh, but I, want to, I just want to mention a couple uh, research studies out there that are uh, have been done that maybe give you some counterintuitive results. For example, uh, the issue of Client satisfaction was mentioned earlier and whether that's a good metric or not. Uh, there's actually a fairly large body of literature that shows that the better the relationship between the client and the auditor, the uh, superior, the more superior the outcomes are when negotiating audit differences. That in fact, there's a, there is a, certainly a, a, a level of trust that allows the auditor to potentially get to a superior position. And that seems a little counterintuitive unless you put it into some other literature other than pure economics. Uh, there's also, particularly out of the Netherlands, there's an organization called the Foundation for Audit Research, which sponsors a lot of research on audit quality over there. I'm happy to be on the board, so I know what's going on there. And they're making a big investment in, in looking at audit teams. And some of the results that they're finding are actually quite interesting. For example, it seems that on a large scale sample basis, and I hate to say this to some of my friends from practice, but the audit managers are probably more important for audit quality than the partners uh, in that they are, have the day-to-day -day hands on engagement. Uh, another study that comes out of Australia, for example, points out that has found that it's actually time on task in terms of the engagement team's experience with the client that matters more. In fact, it matters more than industry knowledge as far as obtaining better outcomes. So all I'm doing, all, all I'm trying to do is raise the issue that some of these things are actually much more hard, much more difficult to interpret than would seem to be obvious when you just look at the way the metric is written and stud and, and, and calculated. Now that doesn't mean we can't do some very large, some large sample. I think Dane has put up a number of postings that suggest we can find tease some of this out from data, and that's that's absolutely true. And so that's something that. Uh, I just, I think, confirms that this is a more, again, a more complicated question than many people realize. And I'm going to throw out my favorite quote. It's not Einstein, but H.L. Mencken, who was a journalist in the 50s in the United States, once said that for every problem, there's an easy, uh, simple solution that is wrong. Uh, and so, you know, that's just the kind of trap that sometimes you have to think about. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. That's a lot of good research. Uh, John Bendel? Thank you. Um, first, thanks to the PCOB technical staff for getting me back in the panelist meeting from the uh, observer meeting. It took a while, but I was able to hear and listen, but I wasn't on video and couldn't raise my hand, um, but I was able to hear everything. Um, so maybe just a couple quick comments because a lot's been said. I'm supportive of the effort to think about how audit quality indicators could be embedded in the performance of the audit, but I personally think that uh, some of the comments around integrating this into how the audit committee engages with the auditor is probably in my perspective most productive and effective i think the relationship between the audit committee and the auditor and the use of audit quality metrics and planning and throughout the audit would be very valuable at the engagement level and at the firm level i think there's value for both but probably more value um, at the engagement level and there's probably a way to design this that would drive a ton of value uh, in that you know, audit committee chair, audit committee, auditor relationship. So I would be more of a fan and supportive of that. I, I'm not suggesting we shouldn't maybe aspire to do more, but that would be maybe the best uh, approach from my perspective as a next step. And then, you know, looking at the indicators in some of the papers, um, I think, you know, there's a wide range. I think another thing the PCOB could probably look at as part of their inspection program, when they're looking at the firms, how does the management committee of the firm or the board of the firm, what are they using to assess all the different aspects of people, talent, performance, defect, et cetera. 
And you know, that might help build some of the research efforts in what would be good audit quality metrics. Because at our company, we have a ton of metrics on all those dimensions and how we run the company and how we oversee the company. So I think, you know, that would be maybe a good point of research as part of the uh, process of engaging with the firms and how they use that to run the firm, manage their quality, et cetera. I think some of that makes way in the public domain, probably some of it doesn't. And how could we think about that in the context of audit quality indicators would be valuable. So um, those are just a couple of thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, John, that's helpful. Uh, Sandy Peters? I guess, you know, one of the things as I've um, listened to some of the comments that um, I guess strikes me is that I think there's a perception that um, that when asking for performance metrics, I think we're calling them EPMs instead of AQIs, um, that, that they are absolute, that that they need to be perfectly comparable before they're useful, right? And certainly um, we don't think they're perfect, right? I mean, when I hear those comments, I think of non-GAAP measures and communication, and I think, well, we deal with all of these same issues in making an investment decision for the company. And they're a point for asking questions, and every, I mean, I audit, I was an audit partner, so I I get a little agitated because I'm like, I know when I did a good audit and when I couldn't do a good audit, right? Because of all of these other factors. So I think there it, it, it's possible, right? It's not perfect. Um, they won't be perfect, um, but, investors want, but investors want to see them because the discussion about the relationship with the client, the investor is the client, right? Um, and and they want to see the information. And certainly we want the audit committee to be actively engaged and move it along and do their duty and all of those sorts of things. So we're not trying to mitigate the governance process. I think actually that came up a bit in the investor advisory group. We're just looking for how we vote this and how we evaluate this and how we make micro and macro decisions with respect to um, engagements and firms. And I think that we need to think about the art of the possible, not the art of perfection, because there is something in here um, that is useful to investors and will get used. It will not, whether you're a small company or a big company, your cap, if you're investing in a small company or a big company, your capital's at risk, and and you care about this. You care about this information. So I just feel the need to convey that all of these things about them not being perfect are exactly the same things we have with financial results and KPIs and other things that investors make complicated decisions. Think about it not as the we are investing in the auditor, and we would like some information to know if our investment is well placed. Thank you, Sandy. That's a good perspective. Dane Mott? Uh, thanks. Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of talk with this whole audit performance or audit quality. I mean, I think we can kind of simplify it, take all the you know politicization out of it and just call them audit characteristic measures or metrics. You know, we're basically looking for descriptors to kind of give us a, give us a sense of what's in the black box. Like, what what are kind of the characters? You know, um, is it a top heavy audit or light? Like, does the audit partner have eight other audits? You know, there's a lot of different characteristics, and it's not any single characteristic that's going to be a defining point. As with most things in investing, it, we take an, uh, a mosaic approach and you pull together a lot of pieces of information and with those information, you come to a conclusion in the absence of complete certainty. Like we're, we're used to that. We, we're used to um, dealing with uh, information that, that requires nuance. And yeah, if, if these, you know, there's the list of audit quality metrics that were in the handout 
I think all of those are great, plus more. And you know, there there should be no issue about um, feeling like what's too much. We can we can deal with information, and they'll all help be helpful context. And at certain times and for certain firms, some metrics will be more useful than other, or the combination of certain metrics um, will be uh, useful more useful than others. Um, but you know, we have to have the data set first to start figuring out what those metrics will be and when they'll be useful and not, but you know, in, in the absence of information, we just don't know what's in the black box. Thank you, Dane. Uh, Keisha? I've been sitting here trying to formulate my, my thoughts uh, appropriately in the, in the amount of, of time that we have, but in the briefing paper, there was of course a table of what is being currently reported. And there were certain measures that were highly reported across, you know, um, most of those firms or things of that nature. So my, you know, thought is, you know, to move this forward, is there a way to almost analogize to uh, the recent uh, SEC pay for uh, performance kind of uh, rule making that said, here are some, you know, measures that you have. And some of these are standardized. It looks like from the audit committee's perspective, they are really looking at things related to turnover and things of that nature. And those are easily to me calculable. Um, and we see that a number of firms are doing that. So dropping that down to an engagement level might be easy, but is there a way to kind of think about it in terms of um, capturing these items kind of that are already you know, already kind of standardized because they're reporting them in this kind of database discussion. And then the other thing in this pay for performance rule uh, that the SEC uh, has issued, it gives uh, the issuer the opportunity to list several other metrics that are relevant for them. And I think this is where we kind of get into this, you know, do we standardize everything, make everybody do the same thing, but is there, uh, as this uh, discussion moves forward to operationalization, is there a way to leave some flexibility to say, here are, you know, X number of key performance metrics we would love for you to report, let's say in form AP, and then give um, some opportunity to say, are there other items uh, that are relevant for your engagement um, that you can then share and disclose and put in proper context? And that to me is a little bit scalable because then you can have um, entities say, well, this is the other thing that we uh, discussed because of our industry, or we're in the broker dealer space, and this is why that matters. Um, but I was just thinking as I'm hearing, it looks like all of us, of course, are in agreement to move this forward. Um, none of these measures are going to be perfect. I come from academia. We know audit quality is crazy to try to uh, proxy and evaluate, but at least to me in this chart, we see some measures that most everybody's doing that we can almost start with. Um, to kind of get some, um, you know, somewhat of a standardization across and then give some flexibility uh, for additional disclosure and discussion in whatever reporting format that we have. So those are my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Keisha. Susan DeRoss. Hi, good afternoon. I'm, I just wanted to make a couple comments. First of all, I, I, I definitely agree with this plan and I've enjoyed listening to everyone's opinions on these topics. I'm, one of the things that, that really sticks out for me is that only 4% of fraud is caught by auditors. I'm, so whether or not we have these, these matrix that are already in use, I think we do need to dig in a little bit further and make sure that we are, I'm, focusing on the things that are truly indicative of uh, a quality audit as opposed to the ones that were obvious fail failures. Um, some other people have mentioned as well, I'm um, obviously quality control, something that's not specifically mentioned. I, I see we're doing a lot of, you know, how many managers, how many um, partners, but I think a big part of that quality control is that when do the people know when to escalate? When, when do the escalations occur? how many of those decisions are being made by lower level people when they should be escalated. I think that would be kind of a clear cut um, thing to consider. Um, obviously experience in turnover and the percentage of managers and um, directors that are involved in the audit. I'm, in my personal preference, I'm, I think when we start to get into the fees and the salaries, I'm, investments in different generic tradings that might not even, you know, apply, like has been commented a little bit before, I would place less emphasis on that and maybe place it in places that are, you know, not quite so obvious. I'm, 
There are two other things I think we should probably address that I don't see here, and it would be um, the use of automation and the controls around any automation that's used in the audit. And then this, I don't know exactly how to fit it in, um, but I'm interested for your comments. You know, th there's always this impression that um, changes year to year are bad. And um, from my experiences, I am, and, and I do specialty work for auditors, um, there's, there's obviously, um, people don't want to have a change year to year, but sometimes it's just simply improving the audit report and improving what you're reporting. So I don't know if there's anything we can, we can do about that or not. Um, and I had a couple last comments just with regard to the questions. I'm, I, I think that if you're going to be someone that's going to cover an issue or client, regardless of size, I, I think that the rule should apply to everyone. I am. I do also think that all of this information, I, I think it was Dane that said, um, we can have all the information, but if it's not easily accessible, I um, love the idea of form uh, AP being a database. I think that's a great idea, but I, I'm, I'm in full support of all of these things. Just wanna make sure we really think through and, and focus on the ones that will mean the most. All right, thank you. Um, I don't see any more hands. And we've almost come to the last bit of our um, session. So, or our time here. So, um, we could end a few minutes early and then come back for our final session, which is fraud at 2.30. All right, thank you. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you, everyone. See you at 2.30. Thanks. So welcome back, everyone. Uh, our last uh, session for today is a discussion of fraud considerations. Uh, as mentioned at the last meeting and, and earlier today, fraud is a project on our midterm agenda and a very important one. Uh, Stephanie Hunter uh, from the Office of the Chief Auditor is going to help guide our discussion today. And uh, she's joined by Brian Degano, an, another team member uh, who's looking at that standard. And so with that, Stephanie, please go ahead. Hey, thank you, Barb. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. As Barb has said, I'm Stephanie Hunter and joining me is Brian Degano. And we're part of a larger team on this midterm agenda project, uh, which is comprised of other OCA professionals, uh, as well as colleagues in the Office of Economic Risk and Analysis. Uh, so before moving into the, spe the specific topics, um, Brian G, can you forward, thank you, to the agenda slide. So you'll, you'll see here that uh, we have five topics um, that we would like to cover. Um, but before uh, we get into the first one, I'd like to introduce, generally introduce our fraud consideration session. PCOB standards require the auditor to plan and perform the audit to obtain reasonable assurance that the financial statements are free of material misstatement due to fraud. Uh, corporate scandals involving fraud can undermine investor confidence and result in significant losses for investors. And indeed, fraud was a driving force behind SOX, and the PCAOB has focused on improving uh, the auditor's consideration of fraud since its creation. Um, as we've heard on other projects today, other standard setters um, are also focused um, on fraud, and both the IAASB and the ASB are looking into this topic. And other regulators around the world have made improvements to their standards in the last few years. Notably, recent remarks by Paul Munter, SEC Acting Chief Accountant, highlight the importance of the auditor's responsibilities with respect to the consideration of fraud. The objective of today's discussion is for CAG members to discuss their views and experiences regarding topics relevant to the auditor's consideration of fraud. Uh, we are interested in hearing CAG member views regarding both potential problems um, and also potential solutions. And as such, the staff has distributed a briefing paper discussing several topics that we'd like to hear from you today. 
including, as you see here, anti-fraud pro programs and controls and improvements in corporate governance, lessons learned from other professions, including forensic consultants, auditor knowledge, skill, and ability, uh, the ever popular changes in the use of data and technology in the audit, and also any considerations or considering whether the existing auditing requirements could be strengthened or improved. In addition, I think this fits in nicely with ERA's request as well, but in addition, we'd be interested in CIEG member views regarding data sources for evaluating economic impact and academic research papers or external reports of which the board should be aware regarding this fraud topic. So let's move on to our first topic. Great. Uh, Anti-fraud programs and controls and improvements in corporate governance. Uh, so before I get into uh, the questions that we have for everyone and, and open the floor to some discussion, I just wanted to say a, a few words here on this particular topic. Companies are responsible for designing and implementing programs and controls to prevent, deter, and detect fraud. Existing PCAOB standards require the auditor to obtain an understanding of and test whether such controls have been implemented when the auditor, and this is when the auditor identifies a fraud risk. The maturity of management's anti-fraud programs and controls impacts the auditor's efforts regarding fraud. Uh, since the existing fraud requirements were last updated, new developments have occurred with respect to anti-fraud programs and controls. Uh, for example, 2016, uh, COSO issued its Fraud Risk Management Guide. Uh, and further, the role of corporate compliance officers has grown dramatically. So this brings us to our first series of questions. Given the related nature of these questions, and in the interest of time, I'm going to open up the floor for discussion on all of these, all three of these, at the same time. Uh, but as a guide, just to keep in mind, uh, we do have five topics. So we'd like to, as a guide, spend around 15 minutes on each of our five topic areas. But of course, we'll, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> so uh, first set of questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, I know most of you um, would have had an opportunity to see these, of course, right? But uh, first question we have is, in your experience, uh, and companies where material fraud has occurred, which material weaknesses related to management's anti-fraud programs and controls were central to the fraud occurring. And the second question uh, we posed, in your experience, what is the state of fraud risk management across public companies? And thirdly, in your view, what, would, what should be done to improve the auditor's understanding and evaluation of management's anti-fraud programs and controls. So I'm gonna open the floor to see if we have any uh, hands up to discuss the questions for this, this first topic area. No hands yet. Mm -hmm. Oh, there goes one. Okay. <laughs> Dane Mott. <laughs> I'll be the, uh, the volunteer. Um, okay, great. I'll try to answer these questions in a, um, in a roundabout way. I mean, I think the first thing is, you know, I cited the statistic before, only 4% of frauds are caught by external auditors. 42% of frauds are caught by um, tips. So, you know, I think that speaks to the need for, you know, something the PCAOB should look into is a whistleblower program akin to the SECs where you, you know, um, create economic incentives for those to put out, um, to point out wrongdoing. Um, so that's one issue. Uh, another issue is, you know, I think auditors are supposed to be independent, right? But there's, there's a natural problem with maintaining their independence in that I think an audit firm can grow to look at their audit cl client like a growing annuity stream. The, the goal is to keep the audit client which then also kind of creates a, a, a problem 
with trying to push back at the client and ask tough questions um, because part of it is, um, you know, uh, involves staying in the good graces of management. So, you know, there's considerations of whether you should have term limits or, or you know, not only where the audit per partner rotates, but where the firm switches out like you have in other countries. That's another issue. And then another thing to try to balance out this whole issue of um, independence, firms might think about having kind of centralized kind of forensic teams uh, that are looking at market data and making comparisons across companies and running metrics, both based off of the data that's available in, in, in the markets, so public information, as well as information that they're capturing from their audits, um, to then have that forensic team go out to um, particular audit partners and say, hey, you know, your, your, your audit, your, the company you're, you're auditing is a outlier on some of these metrics. We're not saying there's an issue there, but you might want to investigate. Or we have our, our team of forensic specialists who specialize in this area, and, you know, we'd like to come in and take a, a closer look. So then you have that partnership um, between the, the on-the-ground auditor managing the engagement as well as kind of a, a, a team that's systematic, doesn't actually necessarily have a relationship with the management team, wouldn't even necessarily need to meet the management team, but they're gathering information and, and learning from it. So, uh, and passing that on to kind of have a balance. So I'll stop there. Yeah, thank you for those comments, Dane. And I know we will also uh, talk some more about um, other professions, including forensic consultants as well. So those are helpful, helpful comments. Um, I see, uh, Jessica, do you want me to flag or? I think Jim Hunt is next. Thank you very much, Stephanie. I, I think in the comfort of continuity, the consideration of a risk-based audit and knowing your client well suggests generally that the risk of fraud is low. And therefore, I think audit teams, again, knowing their client, having continuity with their client, um, kind of stand behind the consideration of both your pronouncements of the auditing standards board before you that says, you know, the, the audit is generally designed, you know, to determine if material misstatement occurs, but, but, but. And so I, I, I think there needs to be greater strength in that because we are seeing more examples of, of I'm going to separate cybersecurity fraud from other fraud, but we're, we are seeing more, more is, instances of fraud where the question is, where were the auditors? And, and, and the answer is, you know, we, we're not sure we know. So part of your paper said perhaps we should create a situation where there's documentation and testing of the consideration of fraud when the risk of fraud seems high. And I would propose that in many instances, you'll never get there because again, an ongoing client, if you think the risk of fraud is high, you're probably gonna, you probably, the client, the audit firm is probably going to dismiss the client. So I think we would, should go a little further to say that in the consideration of a risk-based audit and the consideration of fraud, what are the reviews and tests you've done to make that ultimate determination? If we look at a couple of the most recent frauds that have been widely publicized, things as simple as the inappropriate use of cash confirmations was was alleged to be, I don't know the facts, but was alleged to be the significant consideration of the application of the ultimate fraud. So I, I, I've, I've liked, you know, again, as somebody else said, I have been an audit partner and now I'm an audit committee chairman. And I've liked the ability to have a safe, a bit of a safe harbor at, at virtually every finalization of an audit when the auditors meet with the audit committee. It, and I don't say this, uh, you know, pejoratively, but it's almost an, oh, by the way, almost, it's almost an, oh, by the way, I have to ask you about whether or not you were aware of any instances or considerations of fraud. And I think, I think we should be deeper than that on a continuous basis. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Preeti, I believe, is next. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, so, I, the thing that um, Dane brought up about the 4% of audits being caught by auditors 
if you compare that with the fact that the opinion says that the audit is providing some sort of assurance over fraud that suggests that there is a big expectations gap. Um, and so I'm happy that you all put this on the agenda and I support that. Um, when I think about some specific recommendations, uh, reading through what you sent us, and then I did a little reading on my own, um, I had a couple ideas. One is to increase the training on fraud schemes, that is to require audit firms to step that up. I don't know if that would be part of the QC standard or, or where that would exactly fall in the scope of, of your you know, standard setting. Um, secondly, I really liked what one thing that Dane brought up about using some sort of centralized mechanism to aggregate data and to look for outliers of various financial statement items or ratios or whatnot. Um, the reason is that the audit is so focused on getting evidence from management that by looking externally, we can get the auditor's mindset a little bit towards getting more information from the outside and seeing if that makes sense with what they're seeing internally. So that is one way to do it. But if there are other specific standards that we can somehow move the auditor away from relying on management's information, but externally about um, validating things, that, that is a general move in that direction. So I support that. Um, a couple other areas is to compile disconfirming information or evidence that the auditors have found collectively and require that to be reviewed by the EQR. Because a lot of the audits that where there is fraud, it's simply that the, the evidence was there and the auditor didn't follow up on it. So by adding an extra layer of review, and I, I'm going to put a paper in the chat that kind of supports that idea that that might be helpful. Uh, a couple other ones, um, following up on immaterial errors. These can, if especially if they're being waived, it suggests there might be something else there and auditors need to do a little bit more work to get comfortable with that. Reviewing executive compensation metrics and finally enhancing the unpredictability of the audit. There's a lot of Sally, same as last year going on and generally requiring audit firms to mix up their procedures, their techniques, so that there's a little more unpredictable element may help with uncovering fraud. Thank you. Thank you so much for those comments, Preeti. Appreciate it. Um, let's see, I think uh, Brian Croto is next. Yeah, thanks very much. And maybe I'll just start by saying that, um, you know, obviously the 4% has been thrown around a lot on this, this meeting and it's important probably to highlight that, um, you know, prevention of fraud in the first instance is what, what I think is most important relative to company controls. And it's hard to measure the effect of prevention on, on fraud relative to the existence of the, of the audit to begin with. That said, that the, that's not meant to be defensive or suggest that there's not more work to do for companies and auditors relative to the detection of, of fraud, obviously it's not in auditors or others' interest for there to be lack of reliable financial reporting as a result of fraud. Um, having said that, I think there's a lot that has been done. The PCOB's risk assessment project um, years ago really embedded the thinking around fraud and planning for fraud risks throughout the early stages of the audit through the audit in, in a more integrated way than had done, been done in the past. Your questions that you asked really went to company controls and what we see and, and and ultimately, it tends to be um, issues relative to tone at the top, risk assessment, monitoring, but but sort of multiple coastal level components that are implicated uh, uh, when when we do see uh, a fraud that has occurred that a company's controls has not have, has not been effective at at preventing. Um, you know, in the environment that we've been in over recent years, we have as a firm, and I know the PCOB, and I'm sure other firms have done the same have done a lot to provide guidance to our teams relative to thinking about emerging or changing risks, including fraud risks, whether that be because of the COVID environment, macroeconomic effects, or, or otherwise. And, and then I would lastly say, as you look at kind of the tools and techniques that we use um, relative to risk assessment, where we are better able to analyze full populations, perform better target testing, have more specific identification of fraud risks in the context of our planning, all of those um, efforts, I think, are very positive relative to 
um, you know, the, the topic at hand. Again, not to say that there's not more that could uh, couldn't be done. Uh, certainly, recent speeches from SEC staff focus on this from 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 the PCOB, focus by audit committees, and then ultimately management relative to their over over overlaying controls. And then, as you suggest, um, the, the work that we do as auditors. So all of that working together, I, I think, is is very important. I just wouldn't want to um, leave off that I think a lot has been done, um, which has really benefited reliable financial reporting over the years compared to what we were seeing decades ago in terms of the the, the timing of, of either prevention or detect earlier detection of fraud. Okay. Great. Appreciate those comments. Um, let's see. I'll take a couple more before we move on to our next area. So we have, it looks like uh, Robert Neckel is next. I just want to make a comment about what's going on in the chat box. I'm happy to hear you. Oh. Can you hear me? Uh, not too well. No. You're okay, still move, very move faint. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> it looks like uh, Steve Morrison from uh, Cohen Resnick's got a has some thoughts. Hey, everyone. So basically, in, in terms of this, I agree with what Brian Croto has been saying about there, there has been a lot of work done and it's something that there's a reason that so much uh, money is stolen via fraud, either directly through misappropriation or through a financial statement fraud. It's because it's an ever growing dynamic and it's very lucrative to the people who are able to perpetuate it. And it's so it's something that I think that when I when I look at AS 2401 and, and PCOB as a whole, it's something that I think is going to bear. It's either a constant improvement process, or, or it kind of it, it all in my mind kind of gets back to. And I'm looking at it from the perspective of I, I'm not too far removed from the last audit report I signed. Now I'm in a permanent national office role, so I see these from very basically a very similar perspective. Small, large frauds, whatever the the case may be, or, or the potential frauds. A lot of it, I think, kind of boils down to that application of professional skepticism and audit evidence. So that attitude of the questioning mind, what are you using at audit evidence and so forth? And fraud is not some unique, it's something that's off to the side that we're just going to do a bunch of extra procedures because we're going to, because we need to, or because investors want or whatever it is. Our report talks about material misstatements whether due to error or fraud. And so we we consider error in going through everything. And now we're, we're talking a little bit about fraud. And as standards sometimes indicate, it's hard to sometimes tell what, what is the underlying cause of this. So my per so when we get to, and I, a lot of these questions were, uh, what is going on at the clients and so forth. And, and I think it to me, and I'm putting it in very simple terms, is when I look at, we can talk about the design and implementation of internal control management the, the, or the, the company's overall fraud management and detection process. I kind of look at it more simply for purposes of discussion and say, how do the numbers get on the page? And I think what could go wrong? Okay, you've got a number, you've got disclosures or you're missing numbers and disclosures. How did that, what happened or what didn't happen that should have and that kind of gets back to what someone was saying earlier, the whole risk assessment process. So in my mind, uh, the, where, where these questions are kind of going to kind of fit into our, our in, into the, the framework we have now, the risk assessment standards of the what could go wrong and so forth. But there is a lot of Sally that's out there in the audit profession uh, and also amongst clients as well. And I think that uh, what my experience has been is that where do I learn the most from is it's really a totality of effort, reading standards, going to conferences, seeing things actually happen. But a big part of understanding fraud and being able to detect things further is when you read about an auditor that's missed something or that you something that's happened in your own particular firm or environment or the client you're working on and so forth and reading those ACFE publications that come out and so forth. So. Having those war stories, if you will, for lack of a better term, of what happened, what went wrong, where the auditor missed something, or maybe it was just audit risk that something didn't get detected. It helps us figuratively build a better mousetrap as auditors. And then from the client's perspective, to the extent that they're involved, 
it's that, and I'm sorry for all the, the, um, the alliterations and so forth to build a better fence around the haystack. And I think that part of my understanding the entity, its environment, it's going to be, hey, how do the numbers get on the page? How do the disclosures get there and so forth? And how do you know it's complete, et cetera? It's also going to be, how do you know that fraud's not happening? Management, what are you going to be doing? And whether it's a small firm, small entity, or large firm, large entity, if the client's not minding the store, my audit risk goes, my risk of material misstatement, it, I'm going to have probably a, a greater nature, timing, and extent of procedures that go to it here. So in my mind, a lot of the audit side, the right framework overall is there. It can always, in my mind, it's filling it out with examples that don't just take what's in the standard and make it a checklist, although that might be part of it, but the, the proper education on it and so forth. But on the, I think it is important for the auditors as a part of that design and implementation of internal control. And I think it's kind of already in there to understand what is management doing to make sure that the numbers and the disclosures they're showing you are complete, accurate, valued, disclosed, all that good stuff, that that's materially correct. And so the robust data analytics, like Brian was talking about, there is a lot of data out there. The more that the PCOB could point to, hey, here's some good tools, and I think PCOB, especially the last few years, done a real good job of emphasizing certain practices and so forth that are good, The and the CAQ and others, the more data exchange, the more, um, the dialogue and the more information sharing there is about ways to do this, I think will help drive the quality and get away from the the Sally and and just kind of mindlessly going through. But it get that aspect of it, it's not just a fraud issue, it's a professional skepticism and audit evidence issue. The and as I had a my mentor was a retired Deloitte partner and he just said in the so much of what auditing is, is just asking, how do you know? And I found people, if you can answer that question, how do you know? A lot of times you'll find that you can, you can get there to sufficient appropriate evidence. That concludes my prepared remarks. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate those comments. Um, let's see, uh, Robert, do we want to try again or go to see how your volume is? Well, I can try it. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I don't know what happened. I just. I just wanted to mention something about the 4% and I just put it in the chat box. It's, I think it's, I don't want to go down the rabbit hole there. I think it's a very misleading statistic okay. relevant to our, what we should be talking about, which are us registrants. Uh, but having said that, then, um, you know, th obviously, uh, fraud's an incredibly important issue for the profession to be dealing with. I don't think anybody on the screen would say they're for fraud. So, uh, the question is, how do we deal with it? Um, yeah, you know, I think data and analysis is 1 technique. Uh, I think we have to be, again, we have to understand the limitations there because black swan events, which fraud usually is, are very, very hard to predict using data, you know, data analysis techniques. Um, so that, but that's certainly a tool we should be considering. Uh, but I just wanted, what I wanted to mention was a few years ago, I worked within a firm uh, on this, on the issue of fraud and the data, the statistics are a little bit dated, but at the time uh, we found out that the average partner in that firm had encountered one fraud in their entire career. And then you ask audit partners, how do, how do they detect fraud? They say, oh, we know it when we see it. Well, if you actually don't see it very, very often, if at all, it, that's not a particularly comforting attitude. Uh, and so when we dug down to it, what we found out is, and I think this goes back to Jim Hunt's comment, that a lot of this, the clues come from the interactions with the client. We can use data analysis to help us overlay uh, what we already know, but it's very important to uh, make sure we understand the client at the at a very nitty gritty level uh, in order to be able to identify the conditions that lead to fraud. Whether we can detect the facts of the fraud is one is another thing, but at least understanding the conditions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see. I think Jennifer uh, yeah, Jennifer Burns has been in the queue, so go ahead, Jennifer. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, again, I wanted to share some information that's out there. One, I saw the paper reference the COSO um, broad risk management um, guide. That document has actually been updated and it should be posted any day now. There was a whole committee involved in rewriting it and if it's not out yet, it should be out shortly. Um, and then secondly, the Auditing Standards Board has been focused on this topic as well. And as the ASB embarked on thinking about what is in the AICPA standards 
and what's required for audits of private companies, we wanted to understand what is in the research that exists out there, the academic research, and we're very fortunate that we have an ASB member, Greg Jenkins, who's a professor at Auburn University, and we asked him to undertake a synthesis project, and so he worked with some colleagues, Joe Brazil from NC State University, Tina Carpenter from University of Georgia, Christine Gimbar from DePaul, and Keith Jones from the University of Kansas, and they did a, a research synthesis project for us to look at the um, studies that have been done over the last five years and what they say about um, the identification of fraud, the risk assessment process, and then the response to those fraud risks identified. And they just completed this. They presented their findings to the ASB at our meeting last week, and they will be summarizing what they found uh, in an academic article as well as a, an article that we'll post in the Journal of Accountancy. Um, but I wanted to bring that up because you all might want to leverage what we found in this, what they found in this research. Um, in addition to, to that synthesis project, we also undertook a survey and we're doing a series of interviews and we plan to combine all this information and try to digest it and figure out what we want to do um, in terms of the AICPA's standards. Um, so happy to go into more details about that. And I know that Greg would certainly um, enjoy the opportunity to talk with you about what they found in their research. Um, I also wanted to mention that the CAQ, I believe, publishes, um, they have their anti-fraud collaboration and they do various research um, in, in this area. And they have um, a recent report that talks about, you know, the most common ways fraud is perpetrated. So to Steve's point, you know, learning about how fraud um, occurs and understanding that as a CPA and as an auditor is critical. And I think we should try to leverage that research uh, to help train uh, the profession. Yeah, thank you for all that, Jennifer. That was very, very helpful, very insightful um, from the uh, new COSO guide that we should be expecting to Greg Jenkins at all work uh, on their synthesis paper to the CAQ's work. That's all uh, very informative. We appreciate. Um, I think we have a, a couple more that we'll take, and then I'm going to move on to. Um, and I and I know we'll have plenty of opportunity to uh, comment on these other areas as well. But we had uh, David Faber uh, Fabricant in the queue. David, no. I mean, sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah, just two points. Uh, built one yeah, building sure. off of what Jim said. Uh, I, I do think those questions, those fraud related inquiries of management at the very end of the audit cycle, right before we give a rep letter and get an opinion, feel really watered down to me uh, and kind of procedural and not substantive. And I, and I do think that uh, the auditors could go broader and deeper in the organization uh, and really listen to the responses uh, and maybe cast a wider net with those questions. Uh, is comment one. The second one, uh, a little bit, uh, goes back to technology. Uh, and I do think that uh, with the way companies have advanced their use of technology, we're not getting physical signatures anymore for large, more sophisticated companies. Uh, everything is done with approvals, uh, you know, and workflow through technology. And so I do think technology could be a way to step up the way the auditors uh, think about uh, their preparing their work around fraud. You know, one example that comes to mind, many companies now have, and, and in mind as well, uh, internal threat scores for every single employee when they're logged on to the VPN. And they build a threat score uh, that, that someone looks at and uh, takes action on and monitors people's behavior based on their actions when they're on the VPN. That's just one thing internally that we've done as good risk management policy making, but I think that could also be useful to the auditors. And there are other things like that, that companies are using technology to be better at fraud, uh, you know, eliminating fraud and fraud detection. Thank you for that, David. Um, I think one, one more we have in the queue and then maybe I'll uh, move on. Uh, John Bendel. Thank you. 
Um, very supportive of the work in this area. And the, one of the questions was about how have company controls evolved. I think companies have continued to improve the control environment, but really from my perspective, the focus of the standard setting effort and where it should be focused on is how do we improve the independent work of the auditor? I mean, that's really, I think the benefit here of um, taking on the standard setting efforts for fraud. I mean, I think the company controls are important, but really from this perspective, I would focus much more on how do we improve the independent work of the auditor versus them relying on you know controls at the company. Good for them to understand, good for that to be part of the process, but I would focus more on the substantive side of the auditor. And a couple things uh, when I read uh, the materials, um, you know, how do we think about designing substantive procedures more effectively? I like the idea of using specialists more, the, the you know, idea around the forensic group central, I think even decentralizing the forensic group, maybe it's a presumption you should use people like that on the audit, not to think about general high level questions, but to go in and do real work around what, where could fraud occur? What are the procedures we should do to test to see if fraud occurs? Not to ask high level questions, but to really focus I think external evidence, while it's improved and how it's used in the audit, it can be much, much better. And I think if you can combine external evidence with technology, because you're able to look at large blocks of data to re basically reconstruct um, you know, the financial information and using external information and you know, the internal information, that's very powerful, right? You're able to really get a high level of assurance versus some other technique that might be um, you know, a, a lesser degree of assurance. I think you could design a variety of ways of attacking it from a substantive perspective that the auditor um, could embrace as part of those procedures, whether it be improved substantive procedures, use of specialists and how they help design tests that are unique to each audit, uh, external evidence and integrating that external evidence with data and technology. So thank you. Thank you, John. Now I see Lynn has his hand up. Um, would you like to provide comments now or wait till the next couple of topics? You can go ahead if you'd like. You may be on mute. I think the comments John just made were right, especially in terms of focus. There's been a lot of discussion so far about the company and management's obligations, but that's not in the in the responsibilities of the PCAOB. Uh, what is important from the PCAOB perspective is what is the independent aud auditor doing or or not doing. <clears throat> and having seen literally uh, dozens of these cases, including from the inside out. What I found most often is the auditor uh, was aware of and had evidence of the fraud and then failed to act on it. Um, and uh, they get into a mindset. Someone was talking about the mindset of the auditors. They tend to get into a mindset of rationalizing the explanations and the evidence that the <clears throat> uh, company and management has provided them. And in many respects, we still do the audit the same way we've been doing it for the last 100 plus years. Management gives you the numbers, the financial statements, the disclosures. Then the auditor turns around and asks for the evidence to support that from the same people. And yet we see that from academic research and study of SEC enforcement actions, you know, 95% of the time, the CEO and CFO <clears throat> are both involved in, in the fraud. And if you go in with the mindset that these are good guys and aren't committing fraud, um, you, you you just aren't going to get it. And it isn't that they don't see it. They actually do, in most of the cases, see it. And there is evidence in the work papers uh, of it, but then they don't resolve it. And in some cases, they don't get the evidence that they need. Standards are very clear about needing persuasive 
uh, evidence. They don't get that. They'll have facts in front of them that are contrary. John was just mentioning external data. That's why Wall Street often will find them when the auditors didn't, don't. And in fact, I do think the 4% statistic is a very valid and important and relevant statistic. And it comes from a very credible organization with phenomenal experience in that regards. <clears throat> but they just, uh, they don't look at the external evidence that a lot of people will look at and uh, it's external evidence that is contrary to what management is giving them. And that results in uh, cases that don't come to the forefront. The audit standards with respect to what you need to be doing with the whistleblower hotline and all are probably inadequate uh, at this point in time. Um, so, I think given that the standards for some period of time now have required a high level of insurance, that's the standards define reasonable assurance as a high level of assurance to investors. Uh, I think that's fair for the investors to expect that. And then the audit report says the auditor performed the audit in accordance with professional auditing standards. There was the mention of the wire car card case where the auditors didn't control the confirmation and we've seen that time and time again despite the fact that that's been an audit requirement in the standards for darn near 100 years you know how do you miss on that these days and so uh, when you tell investors you're going to do the audit in accordance with professional standards that you're going to provide a high level of insurance as the standards require and the standards require you to go get persuasive evidence if you fail to do that, there should be no safe harbor. This isn't for immaterial. This is for material uh, misstatements. And if you mislead the investors by making those statements uh, and not doing the audit in accordance with professional standards, there should be no safe harbor. If there's a safe harbor granted, then I see little value uh, to the audit. Okay, thank you for those comments. And I think on that note, uh, we will go back to the slides, Brian, Brian G, and uh, pull up the next couple of topics and the questions associated with that. With that. Yep, they will be up in just a moment. Okay, perfect. Maybe while we're waiting for that. Yeah, while we're waiting. Yeah, 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 waiting. yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry about that. I, yeah, um, no, it's okay. It's the okay. Technical difficulties on my end. So give me just another moment. Yeah, well, while we're waiting, the next two areas, I'm going to go ahead and go through these um, in the questions so we can prompt some more discussion, hopefully. Uh, the next, next topic uh, that we had um, is lessons learned from other professions, including forensic consultants. And, and I think we heard, we may have heard uh, a little bit of this already in a lot of the comments, but uh, perhaps I will just uh, remind us all that existing requirements also contain examples of audit procedures that could be performed to respond to fraud risks. Uh, forensic consultants and other professionals, for example, internal audit, short sellers, analysts who have identified fraud may have additional tools and techniques for identifying fraud that could be performed during audits. Uh, so that brings us, I'm going to go ahead um, Slides aren't up, but I will let you know the, the two questions uh, that we had in this area. Uh, those are, in your experience, what tools or techniques are used by other disciplines? So if, again, for example, forensic consultants, internal audit short sellers to detect fraud. Uh, for example, are there other procedures that could specifically address management, management override of controls? And then the second question in this area, uh, what differences in mindset are there between auditors and other disciplines that are known to detect fraud? Um, so that's, I, I think I'm going to go into the, the third section as well, just so we can open it up 
um, to the two areas, both lessons learned from other professions, including forensic consultants, um, and also uh, the third topic, which is auditor knowledge, skill, and ability. Um, and here, the knowledge, skill, and ability of engagement team members with significant engagement responsibilities should be commensurate with the assessed risks and material misstatement. A further PCAB standards, namely the standard on audit planning, require auditors to consider whether specialized skills or knowledge is needed to perform appropriate risk assessments, plan or perform audit procedures, or evaluate audit results. And PCAOB standards require the auditor to use due professional care, including applying professional skepticism in performing the audit, Professional skepticism is an attitude that includes a questioning mind and a critical assessment of audit evidence. So in addition to those two questions on uh, techniques used by other disciplines, we also like to ask, uh, are there specialized skills or knowledge that auditors might need to be able to detect fraud? And then also in your experience, how might auditor mindset attitudes and cognitive biases have an impact on the detection of fraud in an audit. So I see it didn't, doesn't, oh, here we, we, we do now have auditor knowledge, skill and ability questions up. Great. So let's see, I see Christine. Yes, thank you, Stephanie. And you mentioned that some of some of these responses were covered in the prior question, so I try not to be too right. redundant. But just on the on the tools and techniques, you know, we did talk about technology and data analytics and how that's certainly been helpful in enhancing our ability to uh, detect fraud and to to think about fraud, but I wanted to underscore again, and this point was made briefly, but just to underscore the importance, no matter what tools or techniques, but using professional skepticism and judgment, and you've got all this data, but clearly you're gonna to have to critically evaluate and analyze that data to identify the indicators of, of fraud, and you'll have to have this awareness of the fraud schemes, and we've talked about how auditors uh, themselves may have not actually seen a, a fraud scheme before. And I think this is where it's important. You have the coordination between the fraud specialist and the auditor. And one of the questions asked about the, the mindset here. And I think we look at the skills and the mindset of the auditor and the fraud specialist as being complementary to each other. And that really comes out in the fraud brainstorming sessions where the auditor uh, really understands that particular client, that issuer, their controls, their, their policies, their, their risks. And then the fraud specialist comes in and they understand and have this deep knowledge of actual fraud schemes. And that can be particular to industry too. And so then you went into some questions about auditor skills and, and knowledge. And I do think this fundamental awareness of, of fraud schemes by industry can be very helpful as you think about it. All right, thank you, Christine. Uh, I see uh, Dane Sanza. Go ahead, Dane. I mean, I'll just echo some of Christine's comments. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you do think about this centralized fraud group, someone who's like, you know, a group that's sitting down and, you know, building all these case studies of previous frauds that have occurred, looking at the fact patterns, trying to think about um, statistics and questions to ask to try to put you in the position to find that information. And then you have that team that, as I said, isn't, um, in a relationship with management, so they can stay objective. Uh, you know, in many cases, maybe they never meet management, but they're they're just communicating with the audit partner. They're saying, "Hey, we've raised flags. We're not saying that this is a fraud, but we're raising issues for you to investigate." And then the auditor needs to go look at those issues, come back to the team. That that also kind of creates a you know. Um, where the, the auditor is not all out by themselves. You know, they, they have to kind of communicate back. They have things they have to review and look at, and they're talking to experts who can talk through fact patterns and things they've seen in the past. So um, I think these are things that um, could really help um, organizations um, be stronger. And, you know, think of it from the audit firm's perspective. It's a risk, it's really a risk mitigation group. 
you know, uh, the, the biggest risk for uh, the auditor is that the, the audit's no good. So if this is a group um, that is really focused on professional skepticism, success for them is finding problems. Um, and if they're not finding problems, you know, th that also speaks to how good they are at their job. So then that also, you know, I think there's some natural forces in there that would help organizations be better. Yeah, and appreciate those comments. All, all good. Um, uh, Jim Hunt. Thank you. I'll be brief uh, coming in again, but you mentioned, you know, short sellers. And if you've ever seen a short seller deck, um, they just go all out. They go all into it. And and at the beginning of their work, they don't even get to talk to the to the underlying issuer. So, so in our case, we have the clients right in front of us. And if you said to a, a manager or partner, hey, I think there's a fraud here. The first response was, you better be right, because if we're going to run this down, you know, so if, if you said to any, if you went to anybody on the team and you said, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's, there's some fraud here. Nobody's going to think about the cost of it, but until you get to that point, the amount of time on the audit that you would have to spend in that uncertainty would have to go to a very high level. So I don't know if it was Diane or somebody else that said earlier, asking mm -hmm. the next question and elevating to the next level. I think it's something that you you might be loath to do in the pressures, and, and I hate to bring up the money because again, any any of us that are correctly thinking about this would think about the money less if we knew the outcome, right? Well, if you think about the short seller situation, you know his deck is that thick when he goes in, and he's going to get paid pretty quickly if he's right, he or she is right. If you think about an audit situation where you have a client relationship. The first not thing to think about is, you know, what's the chance we're going to be right about this and how far do we go and elevating it to the next level, even outside the audit team is something that's, you know, probably going to have to have to be further thought about. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that, Jim. Um, Bob Hearth. Yeah, just to comment on a couple of people in terms of the use of technology and maybe just give you a sense from from personal experience. And this has probably been done more on the the internal audit side, but uh, uh, whether it's financial reporting fraud or asset manipulation, you just the ability to run routines like number of journal entries per person, number of journal entries made at midnight, number of journal entries made on weekends and holidays, late entry to the building at like 1 a.m. or now late access to the systems, rounded dollar amounts for entries, the same amount made multiple times, no vacation. Believe me, if you take the highest overtime individuals and get a list, you'll be very disappointed with what you find. Also, perfect metrics. So where something is supposed to be 36.9 and it always is, um, and then also taking the incentive comp plan and figuring out the metrics that drive that. So I'm suggesting there are routines, there are packages you can pull together for clients to run. And the only thing I would add over that, again, from personal experience, the bugaboo around all this is collusion, where sometimes people work really, really hard to make it really, really hard to find the fraud. Yes, thank you for that. Um, next, I believe Diane Rubin has some comments. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, one of your questions is about attitudes or cognitive biases that auditors may have. And <clears throat> in my experience with a with sort of a, a first year staff person, it's hard for them to imagine that an employee at a church would commit fraud or an employee at a nonprofit would commit fraud. Um, they quickly learned that frauds can occur anywhere, but, um, but, but that is something that they have, that they have to learn through training um, by ex hearing about examples or through experience. And quite often the, the, younger, the younger members of the team are, are the ones that are looking at audit evidence. And like um, Lynn Turner said, sometimes the audit evidence is there. And I think that auditing standards need a specific step, just like you, you, you ask, do you know of fraud? There, there should be some sort of question 
by the partners or managers or seniors to their staff. Have you seen anything suspicious, unusual? Um, if you see it, say it. So just the culture, if you see something unusual, tell someone about it. And I, I have seen fraud in my, in my career. It was with private companies. Um, in one case, it was when I was only a couple years in, and it was um, looking at aud audit evidence and exactly what was just previously said. It was a number of um, supporting invoices that had the exact same rounded number or a multiple of the number. And very a little in terms of description of what this consulting service was, and it actually was a finder's fee that was not deductible for taxes and. I asked the president to explain it because it looked so unusual and the and the president said, you know, you got me. I tried to put it over on you guys, but you found it. Um, but but the whole idea is if you see it, say it and get that into the auditing culture. And just like the partner may ask the CFO and the president and, and other members of management, are you aware of any fraud? It, it, I think it should be built into the audit programs to alert your supervisor or someone if you see something suspicious. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Uh, Lynn Turner, and then we have a couple of uh, uh, academics, I believe, coming up too. So, uh, uh, Lynn? No? Uh, Keisha, then? Excuse me. Oh, uh, you, you, oh, had, ahead, you started out this discussion uh, <clears throat> asking the question of, of what do other professions do, such as forensic accountants. There is a huge difference between someone in a forensic role and someone out there doing an annual audit that you have to be cognizant of. The forensic auditor, when they're brought in, they already come in knowing there is a problem. So they definitely come in with a different uh, mindset than what the people that were there for the uh, annual audit. <clears throat> and that was a point that was made by the O'Malley panel uh, 20 years ago, that the mindset of the auditors in the typical audit aren't, isn't uh, uh, one that would uh, adequately address a fraud, even in cases where they had had seen it. And O'Malley's recommendations were to go into a separate segment of the audit each time where you're forced to change your mindset uh, and how you view the audit and how you're viewing the evidence and representations made by <clears throat> management. And it was based upon their review of 60, 65 audits where they actually went into those audits and looked how auditors had thought about doing the audit and what they'd done with respect to fraud. So the board really does need to go back and take a look at uh, what happened with uh, uh, the O'Malley panel and their recommendations. Back to the issue of external evidence, someone mentioned short sellers, I think. Bob Hearth, <clears throat> uh, when we did financial research at Glass Lewis, we found a number of frauds just looking at some of the external information that was available that would tell you that there were problems. And I remember one case where it was a company, Big Four Auditor, uh, but their short selling had got up to 40% level. And when you see short selling get up to those levels, it, it's not just a short seller. There's a lot of people that no longer believe the company is worth what the market is pricing it at, that there's mispricing in the marketplace. And it's because of a reason. 
that the companies can't substantiate with their performance and with their numbers. Yet I have never seen an audit where the auditor ever even looked at or considered uh, the short selling uh, level has considered some of those factors uh, that were previously mentioned. <clears throat> and it's, it's not that the auditors are evil or lazy or some, they just don't have the right mindset when they're in there performing uh, an annual audit. And if the auditors aren't going to do that, and aren't going to find these problems, then it gets back to the issue of, is an audit really worth the money that we're uh, spending it uh, on them in that regards? With respect to the technology uh, question, auditors uh, where I've sat on the audit committee, every time uh, uh, the auditors come in and told us they're using more technology, which I think they are, but they're usually using it to run against the database that the company provides them, that management provides them. And they're not running it against data from external sources that might call into question uh, what management uh, has provided them. And unless we get it to our auditors are really using ex uh, technologies to access uh, external sources, which are publicly available, and use that in the course of their their audit just to run technology and do analysis against the same database that uh, is put together by management who are in the fraud 95% of the time to think that they're going to turn around and tell you I'm committing fraud or give you evidence that calls into question their numbers. It just is, doesn't happen. Research has shown that's a, a pipe dream. Thank you. Thank you. And we will certainly note the uh, O'Malley panel and the minds, short selling mindset and uh, technology. Um, so with that, uh, Keisha, I think. Well, thank you for this opportunity. Um, and my comments are framed with me being a former auditor that lived through a restatement due to a fraud and now being in the front of the classroom. And so in terms of academics, you know, a lot of this conversation, we talk a lot about the research, but I want to roll this back because some of the younger auditors that are looking and probably identifying some of these frauds, uh, they've been students not too long ago. And so in the classroom as an audit professor, we are trying to articulate these things about professional skepticism and critical thinking. And when you see something, say something. But I think as the board continues the standard setting project, uh, this is an opportunity for additional stakeholder engagement uh, with faculty members that are standing in front of these future auditors uh, that you can really, you know, because by the time we get an auditing textbook that might have an updated standard, you know, it is some iterations of years, you know, down the road when something is updated. So I think there's an opportunity here um, as there's more robust focus on the fraud and the need for the auditor to have the right skill set, the right mindset, and we teach it. Um, but if anybody has a college student in their household, you know, we can say it a thousand times <laughs> and they just want to know what, what's the grade. Uh, sometimes we have to kind of change their mindset and this might be an opportunity for uh, additional outreach for faculty members as the standard is being developed to go along so that we are getting that messaging in front of those individuals that will be auditors in a very short term that are going to be executed because I saw it in the restatement that I lived through the person that picked up the facts that had the the fraudulent activity on it was my second year staff who was not the partner walking down the hall. And so we need to be mindful of a lot of the execution of some of the uh, the fraud, the evidence is being looked at by younger staff people. And so what can we do to engage with the individuals uh, in academia that are really uh, teaching those individuals as the standard is being developed so that we are getting that mindset in and they understand the requirements of new standards without having to wait for uh, something to come in a published text textbook. So those are my thoughts. Thank you for the opportunity. Yes, thank you, Keisha. And uh, those are great insights and uh, we'll keep those in mind, uh, especially with respect to stakeholder engagement. So thank you there. Um, next, Jennifer Joe. Okay, um, just to follow up on some of the comments, I mean, um, we're talking about the cognitive issue in detecting fraud. And Robert 
made the point about the base rate experience of auditors that most auditors go through their lives not detecting audit. And then let's go back to Keisha's comment about staff people being the ones exposed. Research actually shows that your junior mm -hmm. auditor is more skeptical mm -hmm. and more suspicious than a partner because over time the partner has learned that odd, you know, frauds rarely occur. Whereas the student has been exposed every time we're teaching them a topic. We teach them the fraud related to that topic. And so they go in expecting to see fraud everywhere. <laughs> um, now, what has research shown? Research has shown that you are penalized if you are a staff auditor and spend additional time hunting for fraud. And then it turns out that there is no fraud that you are penalized on a firm basis. There are also negative incentives if a firm invests in bringing a forensic auditor on an engagement, they do not detect the fraud, but then subsequently the fraud um, occurs, that firm is penalized by jurors. So there is a system in place that does not reward people for searching for fraud because it rarely occurs. I don't know what the solution is to the problem, but I think as the regulators are thinking about the issue and as they're trying to solve the issue, they have to think about incentives around efforts for fraud, even if you don't find fraud. Mm -hmm. and, and those are the end of my comments. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for those insights, Jennifer. Um, I think we have one more hand. Um, hand up, and then we can go in, go go on to the final two topics. Although I think one of the final topics is technology, which we've been discussing. But um, Melanie Lubin first. Thanks, and obviously we see this from the other side. Um, I think that the real challenge is, and this is even a challenge when we hire staff people, either to you know review complaints, review financial information that we get, and, and review you know act as investigators. You kind of have to be suspicious and presume that there's a problem in order to get somebody to have the right mindset going in there, as opposed to think they're walking in to validate something so that they're looking to come up with something that isn't the norm versus something that is the norm and walk in and say, yes, everybody's been doing everything right here. And we have the, we have the same issue if we're sending somebody in for compliance exam or we're sending somebody in to take a look at the numbers where somebody's doing something and see does it look right. It really is, as everybody's been saying, a mindset situation. And we you know, often talk about being able to come up with a hire that has like the right spidey sense to come up with something where they think they're gonna walk in and find a problem or are good at detecting problems or what ought to be a trigger to make them look deeper. And I, I totally agree because we see it on the just the regular compliance side versus necessarily the auditing side that there are problem there are incentives against pursuing something and going down what could be a rabbit hole to try and find out if there are problems and figuring out a way to realign those incentives would be really important. Thank you for those comments, Melanie. Okay. Um, Brian, are we able to put the slides back up? If not, I can go through our uh, final two topics, although I believe we've we've spoken about data and technology throughout anyway. But here we go. Great. So changes in the use of data and technology in the audit. The development of automated and technology-based tools can affect the auditor's consideration of fraud. Uh, certainly, improvements in technology can affect both how fraud is perpetrated and how fraud might be detected. Uh, so we're hoping to obtain uh, member views, although I know we've already heard some, regarding advancements in the use of data and technology in the audit. Uh, the two questions here are, again, how have advances in automated and technology-based tools affected fraud detection? Uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of the increased use of automated and technology-based tools in an audit? Uh, for example, could the increased use of automated and technology based tools influence the auditors exercise of professional skepticism? Um, and before I open it up 
for comments on uh, more com or additional comments on data and technology. Uh, let's go ahead and go into the last slide. So next slide, please. The next topic. Okay. So considering whether the existing requirements could be strengthened or improved. Uh, for this topic, we're hoping to obtain your views regarding how the existing auditing requirements could be strengthened or improved. Uh, so you see here the questions, um, the questions that we have are, how, um, sorry, are there differences between how users of audit reports view the auditor's responsibilities regarding fraud and how the auditors view their responsibilities regarding fraud? For example, is more transparency needed? about the auditor's work in relation to fraud in an audit of financial statements. And in your experience, when has an audit been effective in detecting fraud? When have audits not been effective? And are there some specific changes in the auditor's responsibilities uh, that you would recommend? Uh, so with that, let's see, we have, Hands up. Uh, Melanie, again? No. Sorry, I meant to take it down. Oh, okay. Uh, Preeti. So I just want to reiterate something I said earlier, which is that compiling the disconfirming information and having someone else review it, like the EQR, is a specific audit procedure that I think uh, should be considered. And using, um, making sure that auditors are not using management's uh, people to to validate like underlying key assumptions, and requiring auditors to be using some external party to evaluate that would be important, as well as compiling disconfirming information in those like uh, key high risk assumption areas. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's see, S S Steve Morrison. Thank you. And I incorporate by reference my previous comments and so forth, but I'm going to emphasize the importance of, of professional skepticism and do we really have sufficient appropriate audit evidence and, and kind of speaking to the multiple questions that were were just posed. I do think the the data analytics um, it's generated so, a lot of useful information. It has helped perform, I think, higher quality audits. It's also generated a lot of extra noise. The the and I can't tell you how many times that I would. I'm just going to pick one of the topics that was out there. It's like okay, someone worked on the weekend and posted journal entries, and I look into it and the person's like, yes, Steve, I work from home on the weekend. And the, the issue wound up being more, it's not so much that it was posted on the weekend, but there was also ancillary issues that that may have driven this. But a lot of times it, it wound up being something that was, it just drew out of attention to go ahead and address. So what I'm saying is, is just because that something was on the weekend or something was on an unusual day or a holiday or so forth, Depending on the risk assessment, this is why risk assessment is so important, understanding your entity. If it's a non for profit where the people barely work five days a week and no knock against non for profits, I'm just using that as an example. Maybe I would be surprised if I saw something that was on the weekend as opposed to during the, the week and so forth. But at the same time, maybe the person was working at home, but it gets into knowing your client, knowing the risk assessment. And I think it's provided a lot more data for us to use, but it's the data is useless if the auditors don't really know what they're looking at and so forth. I learned about Benford's law at the University of Florida in the 1990s and so forth, and I saw it used. And I remember somebody in the senior or whatever it was at my prior firm saying, oh, I just ran Benford's law and I just noticed, I asked the client, why the check numbers, they had a lot more checks with a one. He had completely misread how to use Benford's law and so forth. And on top of that, all he had done was just ask the client for the reason and wrote it down. Obviously, that requires more follow-up and so forth. So a lot of the data that's being generated, it's it's not all bad data. It it can be it can lead to some very good things, but it's a lot more noise and it requires a lot more training and insight, possibly involvement by more experienced people, 
possibly the, the forensic folks getting involved and something that was said in the last session about the mindset, there's, I guess I'm going to put it on a spectrum that trust, but verify, but even more extreme to say, just, it's even worse to say, just taking the guided tour. That's not what's called for suspicious mindset, which remember the, the audit is looking for misstatements caused by error or fraud. So if we have this suspicious mindset and we're all we're worried about is fraud and we miss the fact that the client made a noticeable error, um, that that we that could be a failure as well. That that appropriate mindset, which is that professional skepticism, that attitude of the questioning mind, I think thinks really is, is important. So, a summary to what this is saying here, where I I'm standing at this time on here is that yes, there's a lot more noise, but I think overall that's good. There's a lot more data. It needs to be more focused. We need to be more robust with it and analyzing it. Not just, and if you say, hey, I'd like, can we get more information? That'd be great, but what are you going to do with it? And does it, is it valid information? Does it help us build that sufficient appropriate evidence with which to base an audit opinion on? Or is it just decorative, extraneous, or just something just to look like we're busy and so forth? So is it relevant to our audit? And then to the point about my own personal view in terms of transparency and, and so forth, that's where I, I think that it, we got this, you know, the, the audit opinion is error and fraud. And the, what I used to say to some people when SAS 99 came out and they were so laser focused on fraud, that's great. We do need to worry about that. But you know what? And I'm not speaking for all users here, but there's say a, a lender uh, that's out there. And if the audit report just said, don't worry, we didn't find any fraud. The lender might say, that's great. Can they pay me back my loan? Uh, can I look at these numbers with these accurate numbers and so forth? I know they're honest, but what what if it was an error? So it's the appropriate context between error and fraud that it's a problem of balance is the right word, but that we do have sufficient appropriate audit evidence to base our opinion on the financials in accordance with GAAP or whatever financial reporting framework. So when we look at something in isolation like fraud, my caution is is not to throw the auditor to just being a forensic expert and forgetting about error, but to really focus in on the risk of material misstatement and so forth. And we're that I'm gonna tie it back to your question, which is transparency in terms of fraud. I caution against really adding so much more. I know the AICPA report has has the, the wording dealing, but hey, fraud might be harder to detect because of collusion and so forth. PCOB wording, but there's some wording in there as well. Um, I would worry about focusing it too much because it just might confuse the, the reader in terms of what the actual audit is. It's not a forensic examination. It, it's we're looking for that reasonable assurance about the financials as a whole in accordance with the framework. So that's what I had to say. Okay, thank you, Steve. Uh, I believe uh, Brian has his hand up. Yeah, just very briefly, and, and I alluded to this earlier, but to be sure in the context of your question, I don't think that there is anything um, broken or in need of fix within your current standards relative to the clarity of the auditor's responsibilities or um, the, the requirements that you've set forth, particularly given all the work that was done around the risk assessment suite of standards, um, and in, in, including at the time the auditor's response to fraud um, or, or fraud risks. And, um, you know, I think everything that we're hearing today is consistent with your existing standards relative to, um, you know, think, thinking about new and emerging risks to fraud, thinking about controls appropriately, thinking about how we're using technology and data, uh, and, and introducing appropriate unpredictability here in, 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 in audits. And so I think those concepts are well embedded within your standards today. Uh, I think there's a lot that can be done relative to promoting good practices and, and appropriate application of of standards and the staff certainly has done a fair amount in that regard and there's always more I'm sure that could be done. We do a lot of that as as a firm relative to thinking about emerging um, emerging risks in the changing environment that our teams are operating in and really asking our teams to step back and think about um, how that may um, result in manifestation of new uh, new risks, particularly again in the economic environment where, that we're in now where this may be the time when um, when fraud first begins to manifest itself. So, I, I, I do think um, there's a lot that can be done and should be done in, 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 in the context of the current standards, as opposed to suggesting that you necessarily need revision to existing standards, either to redefine or better define obligations or, or, or requirements. 
Thanks for that, Brian. Um, Sarah, Sarah Lord. Thank you. I, one of the things that I'm stricken by as I'm listening to this conversation is a lot of the items that are being discussed actually are being done by auditors. So some of the different routines that are being talked about, um, Diane, your concept of if you speak up, you know, say something, if you see something that that I mean, yes, that is core in our training on professional skepticism. And so I wonder as we move this forward, if it would be beneficial to do kind of some roundtables where maybe some of the firms share at a more deep level, here's actually what we're doing. You know, the standards say this at a more general level, and here are the automated routines that we typically use. Here are the ways we interact with our staff. Here is what, you know, how an audit partner or manager makes sure they're asking the question and not penalizing somebody for trying to you know, raise their hand if they're seeing something that they don't understand. And that might be very informative to the standard setting process, as well as to just the general understanding of kind of level setting. Like, are we coming from the same place of understanding what's going on to be able to move the discussion forward? So that might be, I know you're working through the different uh, working groups and you know how all of this is gonna fit together, but if there's an opportunity to do that, I would think the firm, you know, we would, well, I would welcome it. <laughs> you know, I would think other firms um, would likely do the same, and that might be a, a way to bring this conversation together a little bit. Thanks, Sarah, uh, for the recommendation on the uh, roundtables. Thank you. Um, uh, Jennifer Burns. Thanks, Stephanie. I was just going to add that I really like the idea that Sarah is suggesting with the roundtables. I think that's an excellent idea. I do think fraud is being identified today by auditors. It's just that you don't hear about it in the news because we don't get to advertise the fact that we've found fraud in a particular instance, um, particularly in the in the private company space. We're, hap we're finding it more and more with the use of technology. Um, but again, it doesn't hit the news. Um, what happens is in reality, the auditor, when they do detect it, um, you know, they uh, quickly ask the company to engage in an investigation and the auditor stands down and waits for that investigation to be complete. And then ultimately, even though in situations when the auditor does identify it, the auditor ends up getting sued. So um, I just want to, to mention that, that I think the profession is, um, is finding fraud, particularly in the use of technology. We're hearing about it um, through uh, practitioners on the board and, and in the field. So that does happen on a regular basis. Um, I do really like the idea of the round table, Sarah. So I think um, sharing best practices and helping others uh, figure out what we could be doing better um, is a great idea. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, any other any other comments uh, before we oh questions? Hey, Stephanie. Yeah, just real quick, you had, you had asked um, a question about some of the challenges that could be posed as we <clears throat> as we leverage data. And as you, you've heard a lot of a lot of folks say, you know, as you know, I think as Brian and Sarah intimated, I mean, I think auditors are using a lot of techniques now. The the ability to to leverage data to give you a lot more interesting insights. You know, when we execute <clears throat> the audit, including the journal entry testing for management override that are required by the standards. I, mean, I think we. We do have a lot more data that we're able to more easily um, kind of uh, digest and, and analyze to help identify um, <laughs> potential risks of, of fraud. But but to, to the points that were raised, obviously, um, the ability to, to to look at that data with skeptical mindset is really important to know what to, you know, data may or may not say anything. Data itself doesn't necessarily just jump out and tell you something. You have to kind of go into it with some expectations. And ideas as to what 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 could be problems, and you know, I, I will say, I guess one of the things we you know we see within our within our context, I, I suspect it's not um, it's not unique. Is you know the you know there is some comfort with the use of technical you know data and analytical techniques that what comes out of the system you know uh, makes makes some sense. So I think within our within our within our firm, I'm sure within others, you spend you know, really, uh, when we when we incorporate techniques, you know, it's again really important that we you know leverage you know between learning and how we build the programs, how we leverage the techniques that you know you really emphasize the need to leverage them with that skeptical kind of mindset. But it is you know there is I think some inherently some 
some, you know, for some auditors, right, it's inherently can become challenging to, to keep that momentum up consistently. And so that's something we, you know, I think we consistently, um, we, we are very mindful of when we roll out techniques, we're very mindful as we train our folks. Um, but I think inherently, just like, you know, I think, you know, companies, when they're leveraging systems, you, you have a lot of confidence, they operate consistently. I think that's something that I think environmentally, I think we recognize as we go through it. And, and certainly the power of the technology and the use of the analytics is, is, is really helpful and it adds a lot to audit quality. Um, but, um, but there are also things you have to be mindful of as you leverage it, I think. Okay. Thanks for those insights from the profession, Josh. Um, Lynn, did you, oh, your hand went up, but now down. Okay, you good? I, I had a call come in, but I'll skip that. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> the uh, one thing to think about here in an overarching way is uh, towards the start of this conversation, uh, Brian Croto made a very apt observation that, you know, frauds involve having to try to assess the tone at the top in some of these organizations. And uh, if you're close to people, that is just a matter of human behavior that's very difficult to do. But you got to have the right tone at the top, <clears throat> or you have bigger problems in the organization. And both EY and Price Waterhouse Coopers have published excellent surveys reports this year that deal with uh, what's going on uh, in businesses as far as ethics as far as trust, um, as far as people doing the right thing. And both of those studies indicate that we're not in a really good environment today. And you overlay on top of that, that the economy is <clears throat> facing some very tough uh, rate hikes and slowdown and the earnings I saw the other day are actually starting to slow down on companies. So you've kind of got a perfect storm type situation, which is a very difficult thing to throw auditors into. It's always a very uh, tough time for them. Probably the toughest time for the toughest job in the business community. <clears throat> but at the same time that we observe that, we're also seeing things where firms have stolen data from the PCLB at the highest level uh, of, of the firms where there's been serious questions of ethics uh, being raised, uh, cheating within the firms. And I think the PCLB has got to step back and think about it. If you've got those type of conditions, going on in the firms, and it's not just one firm, but that's been observations that we've seen out of uh, enforcement actions uh, uh, for in all the firms and, and quite frankly, around the globe. <clears throat> the real question has to be, if you've got that culture and tone at the top at the firms, can you really expect when the firms face a very difficult situation during a very difficult time, can you expect them to stand up and do the right thing? And 20 years ago, the answer to that question was no. And I hope this go around, we get a different answer. Thank you, Len. Uh, Jeff Mahoney, uh, perhaps we'll have the last word on this. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I support the, the, the notion of holding roundtables. And just as a historic point, I, I would note that the Treasury Committee more than 10 years ago, in which Lynn and I and perhaps some others in this group participated on, made a specific recommendation that the PCOB uh, create a national center for market participants to share experiences and develop best practices related to fraud prevention 
and detection. And the committee specifically stated in making that recommendation that they believe that a collective sharing of fraud prevention and detection experiences among auditors and other market participants will provide a broad view of auditor practices and ultimately improve fraud prevention and detection capabilities and enable the development of best practices. So just a historical point, thank you. Thank you. So, wow, we've, we've, uh, we've heard a lot today and I, uh, Brian, are there any, uh, uh, summary points or closing words that you would have for everyone? I, I think we did hear a lot today, a lot of good suggestions, a lot of good information, including references in the uh, chat box to specific academic reports and, and different external reports and other sources of data for us to consider. So, given that you've given us all so much to think about, I think we now need to go back and start looking into those uh, different items, uh, you know, and also including going back and looking into some of the previous recommendations from other um, committees, such as ACAP and the O'Malley panel. So, I think, uh, thank you very much for all the information you guys have provided to us today. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephanie and Brian, too, for, for guiding our discussion. So thank you for, for that discussion and all the great discussion that happened today. Um, while this is our last planned meeting of the year, you know, we look forward to engaging in the new year. And uh, I, I, it, it's hard to believe how quickly this year went and I feel silly, but it is time to say you know, that I wish you the happiest of holiday seasons if we don't speak before then. Um, for, for members, uh, please remember to save the dates uh, we're currently hoping to have meetings on March 30th, June 29th, and November 2nd. Um, and again, thank you for all the input, but I, I too want to take a moment to thank uh, some of my PCOB colleagues who worked very hard behind the scenes to make today possible. And so, as always, I thank Jessica Watts, uh, Danny Verbeck, and Akiko Upchurch from the Office of External Affairs, Kent Bonham, Todd Cranford, Brandy Boykin, Andrew Gillies, Brian Goodnaw, Will Grovick and Meredith Mall, and, and last but not least, Maya Mazel from our Office of Data Security and Technology. Uh, we're, we're very lucky to have such a wonderful group of members. And, and again, we look forward to working with you. And uh, if you have any questions, you know, please feel free to reach out. And thank you once again for your participation in today's meeting. <laughs>